My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I've spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, Ryan Hendrickson. Ryan has served the United States Navy, Air Force, and Army. While in the United States Army, he served as a Green Beret who was dealt a catastrophic injury from an IED blast while deployed in the War on Terror. Ryan has earned the Silver Star, four Bronze Stars, a Purple Heart, and an Army Commendation Medal with Valor. He's been deployed and conducted operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and several South and Central American countries. Even after retirement, he served our country as a military contractor in forward areas of operation. It's with all the honor and respect due that I welcome you. What's up, Ryan? Hey, what's going on? It's good to uh, good to finally make times meet. I know we were trying to do this in Afghanistan, but that that internet out there, I just we wouldn't have been able to carry on that long. So yeah, I uh, I'm I'm kind of glad that you came back and and finished everything up before we did this because I think it's going to give a kind of a different perspective on everything that's going on right now and everything that you've done in the past. So there's so much to talk about. This book is absolutely amazing, Ryan. Um, and I want to tell you, I don't know if you hear this about audiobooks and stuff, but the guy you got to voice it and read it is absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah, that's that <clears throat> that all happened when actually I was in Afghanistan in 2020 for my first trip as a contractor and I didn't even know I, I knew the book was releasing but I didn't know anything about a about an audiobook or anything like that. And then um this this kid walked up to me and he was like, "Hey, uh, you know, Mr. Henderson cuz apparently at 42 years old, you're the oldest thing that they've ever seen." <laughs> um, hey, Mr. Hendrickson, uh, did you write a book? And I was like, no, I didn't write a book, man. Because, you know, I'm not there to promote a book. I'm there to do my job. Right. I was like, no, I didn't write a book. And he goes, are you sure? Are you Ryan Hendrickson? It's like, yeah, man, I didn't write a book. And he pulls the book out of his bag and he goes, that's weird. This kind of looks like you. I was like, man, you little smart ass. Let me see that book. <laughs> so that was the first time I actually got to hold the book. And then so I got online and I was like, man, what's going on now? The audio book is out and everything. And I'm like, holy cow. Um, okay. Yeah. And apparently the guy knocked it out of the park. I haven't had the guts to listen to it yet. Oh, it's, but, it's, um, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, he, I think he brings so much, uh, life to your, I guess you would say for the book character, but your actual persona, he brings so much life to it, but we have a lot to talk about, lots of comparisons and things like that. And I want to start with early life. Now your dad was a Vietnam veteran. Um, he had very few stories that he ever told anybody about it. Um, he, you know, it seems completely different from what you've done now. Of course that came later on in your career that you talked about it and stuff, but uh, that's a big compare and contrast with him because you guys are, after reading the book, a lot alike in a lot of ways, and you guys are <laughs> different in a lot of ways. And you speak so great about your dad through this whole book, and he's a really interesting part of the story. Um, and he, I want to read a quote from it. It said, but what he saw, did, and experienced would stay locked away in whatever closet he used for his demons. And then you, on the other hand, let all those demons out on paper and let everyone know everything that happened. So tell me how you come to this, because that can't be an easy thing. No, it's <laughs> no, it, one of the, one of the hardest things I <clears throat> I've ever done in my life um, was basically uh, putting my life, my life out there on blast because if anybody's read the book, it's not a chest pounding war story at all. It's not this, you know, this hero that rises up and does all this great stuff. No, the book is full of uh, pits that I've dug for myself, self-induced, you know, pain that <laughs> that could have been avoided if I just would have A, B, C, D, or E. Um, failures, multiple failures, a few successes, um, and then failures again. And 
and whatnot. So it's, it, it was definitely very hard to, to put all that out there, but it's a different generation also. So your Vietnam vets, um, they're coming off of the generation where they where their dads were telling them like a, a man's job is to suck it up and do whatever you have to do, but it's no one's business. This is your issue and your issue alone. Don't make it anybody else's business. And I do agree with that to a point. <clears throat> I agree that, you know, a lot of people, um, they will use the excuse of, and I, I know this may rub some people the wrong way, but they'll use the excuse of, I saw this, so now you owe me this, or I deserve this, or I'm going to treat people like this because you have no idea what I've seen, been through, heard, whatever. And, um, and that's, and that's the one part that I disagree with completely is because you can open up, you can get this out. There are people that understand it. There are people that are feeling just like you crazy enough. And, um, in the end, we're, unfortunately, I think, um, people are feeling like there's no, mm, I guess people are feeling like there's no other place to turn. They have no one who understands there's nowhere to go. They're at the very lowest of their, uh, of the lows. And I, I, I do believe that it's, it's playing directly into this veteran suicide pandemic that we're seeing right now. Um, but you know, back, back when my dad was coming up and whatnot, it wasn't manly to show, um, emotion. It wasn't manly to show that you're hurt and it wasn't manly to show, um, uh, anything that is <laughs> that makes you look weak, and so um, now it's a little bit different because we are um, we are struggling with some mental health issues right now that that need to be addressed, and people need to <clears throat> break out of those you know that 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 concern that people are going to look down on them for being weak or had a moment of need or whatnot like that, and that was my biggest struggle is I didn't want people to see me as weak. And so, yeah, it was, it was hard. And I still, I still struggle with it time to time. I did the, I did the one no, no that you're not supposed to do according to Joe Rogan. And that's don't ever read the reviews. And I, you know, and I've seen, I've seen a few where I'm just like, man, you didn't, you didn't have to go there, bro. But again, it's, you just, I, I, I do think the fact that people are, um, you can't hold it in. And now that we're starting to get away from this stigma of um, of weaknesses, cowardice, or weakness means you're not a man. Now that we're starting to get away with or get away from that, um, I I do I do think that more people need to be telling their stories because my story is nothing compared to what I've I've I know of other men and and other people out there that could that could definitely if they told their stories, people people could heal from it. So, well, I don't know if I would say I your, uh, your story's nothing compared to theirs. Cause I think uh-huh. you've got quite an amazing story talking about your father a little more. You said that he was of the mindset that this was his issue and he was damn sure that he wasn't going to let others into that part of his world. And that's kind of what you uh-huh. talked about there by that was hard for you to let other people in your world. Now it took, and we'll get into it a little later on, but it took kind of a team and a village to get you to do that. Um, Uh at, at the end of that, but I want to go back even further with your father and I want to talk about kind of growing up with him. And, um, Uh there's some, you did some pretty nomadic things. You, you traveled across the, the Northwest a lot, the Pacific Northwest, a lot going from place to place. And I want to talk about some of those places because I I think that they kind of shaped who you were. And I want to know if you feel the same way that I do about it now, I want to talk in particular um, about your dad the night that you guys are there. You say that he, you know, at some points he didn't make very much money, but he always tried to make a good life for you. But he would still get drunk. And the night that he was going to take his life and he drives over to your Uncle Steve's and uh, Mm -hmm. this man appeared out of nowhere and came up to him, knew his name and everything. And he, you said he didn't completely change his life, but he headed down a different path. Um, if that wouldn't have happened, what do you, where do you think he's at now? Uh, if if that wouldn't have happened, he wouldn't he wouldn't be here right now. Um, he was fully intended on doing what he uh, 
he was taking us over to our uncle Steve's house to do. And, and that was to take his life. Um, he had, he had, he had buried himself so deep inside of this, this, this hole that he just felt like he could never get out of. And all he was doing is hurting my sister and I, um, by, you know, by all of his demons and everything like that. And he had gotten to the point to where he thought the best thing he could do for everybody around him <clears throat> was just to, to kill himself because it was, um, all, all he, all he did, um, he felt like all he did was just destroy everything around him. Um, and yeah, that's, he, he was just, he was just done. Well, I want to ask you about that because one, he never talked about that kind of stuff. He never talked what was bothering him. You and I have already talked about that a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think it was that was, was driving him down into this abyss so much? Uh, was it that, that the work wasn't coming in steady? Was it the stuff that happened in v Vietnam? Was it that he was being nomadic? What do you think it was? And, and it might not have been one thing in particular, but what do you think it was that was just, you know, burying him in this abyss? It was a combination of everything um, <clears throat> from failed marriages to uh, Vietnam to being what he quote unquote um, perceived as a failed father because uh, before, you know, as you read in the book, before the spotted owl, I mean, this, this guy was making millions in the logging business and now all of a sudden bankrupt, no money, nothing. Now he's a failed man. And a lot of people today, they don't recover from that at all. But the biggest killer was um, booze. And he just, he just kept just sinking himself deeper and deeper into booze. And unfortunately, uh, people make some pretty rash decisions. Um, when, under, you know, with the, with, with the bottle right next to him, you got a bottle and a handgun, something's going to happen. Do you think that any of that traveled forward to you? You, you talked about the booze and stuff. Was it ever conscious in your brain growing up? Like, <laughs> man, I want to stay away from that stuff or anything like that. Did you try and separate your stuff? Cause as we know, when you got older, you were in the military, you, you drank and stuff just like everyone does. But yeah. was there ever a point in that young part of your life where you were like, man, I'm th that, that shit is no good for me. So it probably could have been that way if it wasn't for my dad taking the extreme heavy handed, um, I guess, position on booze. So me growing up, even, even to mention booze would have sent my dad into an absolute, not, not rage, but he would have been very, very <laughs> adamant on, you will not grow up to be a loser like me. You know, even after he found Christ and became a pastor and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Alcohol was the absolute de devil and one sip of alcohol and your whole life is ruined. You will never recover from it. You're a piece of shit for the rest of your life. That's how I felt. And so it kind of drove me towards it. Why? Because I'm a big dummy. And if someone says it's going to hurt really bad, I, I want to prove to them that, yeah, it probably is. But I found out for myself. <laughs> so um, there was one incident in high school where I got drunk the first time drinking and one, um, a couple of the ladies at our church, like had to hide me, um, so I can sober up. So my dad didn't find me cause they knew, they knew what would happen if my dad found out that I had drank everything else. Like he understood, you know, he understood, you know, young Ryan trying to hook up with a girl, whatnot. It's like, Hey, you get her pregnant, man. You know, what's going to happen. You're, uh, <laughs> you're going to marry, you know, stuff like that. Um, but booze, mm -mm. that was, yeah, he, that was a big I don't know what he would have done if he found out that I drank that one time in high school. And that's all I drank. I drank once in high school because I was scared. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting though, that you say that because I don't think that that characterizes your father in the book by any means, but there's a lot of mention of him drinking and being able to polish off a lot of alcohol and stuff. So I'm guessing that he equated in his mind being a loser with the alcohol, not with anything else. I, I, it was kind of a double-edged sword for him. He liked it, and he also hated it for everyone around him. Does that sound correct? Um, it was an escape pod for him because of everything that was going on. Um, multiple marriages, uh, failed jobs, 
um, it, it, it was an escape pod for him. And so he can escape into his world um, under the influence of alcohol. And then, yeah, now, now my dad, you know, he's gotten to a point to where he can sit back and drink two beers and, 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 and he's fine. That's it. Um, he, you know, he's gotten control over it. So it wasn't necessarily the alcohol. It was more the, um, running away from, you know, Vietnam, failed marriages, um, life in shambles, stuff like that. Well, I want to talk about a specific place that you lived and, uh, my wife is from the, uh, great Northwest. Uh, she's mm -hmm. from Washington state and I want to talk about a specific place that you lived and that's Birkenfeld. Now <laughs> you describe it as between, uh, Astoria and I think Portland, right? Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's where it's at. So let's talk about Astoria first. I was just there about a month ago. Uh, I was at nice. Long Beach. I was in Long Beach staying down at the beach. Uh, mm -hmm. In all the times I've been to Washington, all the times I've been to Oregon, I've never crossed over the Astoria Bridge. And really? I, I was visibly shook driving over that bridge. That is the worst <laughs> bridge in the world. Worst bridge, hands it, down. <laughs> it is I never realized how tall that thing was until I drove up mm -hmm. on it. It is unbelievable how high that thing is. Yeah. And so yep. when we talk about that, where you, where you lived in Bergenfeld, the house had no running water and limited electricity. Yeah. So while I'm reading this, I'm thinking about it and I almost feel like that gave you almost a a place in your heart or a way to understand when you're in places like Afghanistan, Central and South America, because you were talking about your sister and you moving pails of water and surviving on hot dogs, mac and cheese, things like that. Do you think living like that and, and coming up, making you strong like that gave you more empathy towards these countries and towards the people that you're in their countries for your whole career? Yeah, one, one, 100%. I mean, it took me a while to connect the dots on why I had such, um, <clears throat> such a soft heart towards, you know, um, I, I guess you would call it indigenous, but you know, whatnot like that. And such a, just, just this disdain for what I assumed was the the more you know the more righteous like we have we have all this and you have nothing or something like that and I had to get control over that because I I was you know it really it really bothered me a lot in in school and whatnot especially getting picked on and then once you learn how to fight they just go to talking shit behind your back and everything like that but yeah I I I do I do like being in the military and whatnot like that some of the stuff that I went through and I remember we were in I think it was Peru um someone's like I can't even imagine living like this and in the back of my head I was like <laughs> yeah I mean I not not only was I in the the Navy in the mid 90s so that's really horrible living but I lived in a tent for, you know, my, my sister, my dad and I, we lived in a tent and we lived in a house that had no running water and to, you know, to get water. My dad had severe pneumonia at the time. So um, he, he was laid up in bed. And so it was up to my sister, seven, eight years old. My sister at eight years old, it was up to her to take care of my dad, take care of me. And, um, and yeah, it was, <laughs> it was um, so we had this wood stove. And you could set um, you you could set pots and everything like that on top of it, and then you know you put in your wood, get the fire going, water starts boiling, and now you got, you know, you have you have um, sanitized water, whatnot. So, um, but yeah, it's I, I I I look back on it, and I've had people comment before. They're like, "Oh, I don't even know how you do it, did it," but I actually don't think like it wasn't bad. It made me who I am today. Number one. And number two, I'm still here, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I do. I, I really think the way that I grew up and some of the, some of the trials I went through, I had a good upbringing, but some of the trials I went through, um, I do believe it prepared me for, um, for the, 
you know, the job that I would come to have after my trials in the Navy and the Air Force, which was a Green Beret. So, yes. So you talked about, you know, the kids making fun of you. Then when you can learn to fight, they just talk about you behind your back. Mm -hmm. Do you ever remember as a kid? Because every time you talk about it, as, as bad as things may have got or as good as they were with you, you seem very, and and it's throughout the entire book, you seem very even keel. Mm -hmm. And so were you ever angry as a kid getting teased? I mean, like, that's not your <laughs> fault and stuff. And, and kids, as we know, can be like the cruelest in the world. But was there ever anger? Was there ever, I don't want to use the word rage, but, you know, where it kind of stokes that fire to be better, to do better? Yeah, there was there was anger and there was rage a couple of times. Um, to this day, I could never do um, the uh, boots to teacher program or whatnot because I will absolutely destroy a bully. And then, you know, you go to jail because apparently you, you can't be a 42 year old guy beating the crap out of a kid. I, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but um, I do not handle bullies at all. It 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 may I, even seeing it on TV. I just break out in a sweat and I just want to just destroy <laughs> so yeah it it did it really bothered me and i guess to this day you can still say it affects me um which is so weird because you know i'm a 42 year old man and i've done a little bit in my life but you know getting teased and getting bullied back in the day all the way to when um like, like there was a couple instances you know the um you'd have the people that you know for for the for the christmas week you know we're we're, we're, we're going to go and we're going to help out the little people. Yeah, let's go door to door and hand out turkeys and stuff like that, regardless of their intentions. But their kids come with them. And then those kids go back to school. And now you're getting teased because you got you got a Christmas box or whatnot. Or you got hand-me-down clothes. And one incident happened. Um, first time I got in a fight. And um, this kid, you know, I was wearing this sweatshirt that I got. And uh, <laughs> this kid came up and he goes, that's my sweatshirt. It's, no, I got this for Christmas and he tore the tag off the back and his name was on the tag. And I was just like, geez. so it was, yeah, I mean, I had some moments, but I believe, you know, those moments is also what built in that empathy. And, um, and, and, and the thing, and I guess one of the, one, one of the big things that I have is regardless of how down on your luck you are, I'll never look down on anybody before because, I was that person that was looked down on before. And my dad, you know, my dad always told me, don't, don't ever, don't ever judge your worth by what those assholes think. They're a bunch of hyenas and they feed off each other. You, you get these people and they'll come to church on Sunday. So they feel good about themselves. And then they're good Monday through Saturday to do whatever they want. As long as they get that one day in and they hear exactly what they want to hear. Don't let those hyenas or those jackals, don't let them get to you. Your worth is not, what they think it is. And I believe there's an issue um, in America with that today because, you know, reality TV shows and all these dramas and everything like that are exploding because people want to define their worth by somebody else's life. And, um, you know, I got caught up in it too. Like I, I believe I should have been, you know, Dwayne Johnson instead of him, but it didn't work out that way. But, um, <laughs> but people get caught up in, in this, like, well, if I'm not like this, then, I'm worth nothing. I think they call it the Joneses or something like that. I don't Keeping know. up with the Joneses. Yeah. But, um, but it, it's the truth. And my dad drove it into my head. <laughs> I mean, very forcefully growing up. Don't ever let what somebody else has to say, define who you are as a man. And that really came into play after I wrote this book, because, you know, I was, I, I was, I was definitely the guy that I didn't want to hear anything negative about the book. Um, I was worried about what people thought and it did, it played off my emotions until I was able to take those lessons learned and, um, and adjust fire. You know what I mean? It's like, Hey, you know what? Who cares? Who, who cares? And, um, yeah, I mean, that, that was, that, that was a, those lessons, um, that I learned from, you know, growing up and whatnot like that, uh, they, they, they have, they still keep. Um, coming up today and I and I keep having to revert back to yeah yeah that's right no it doesn't matter 
It doesn't matter. You know what? Reach out to the guy and say, hey, I'm sorry you feel that way, man. Um, I really hope I really hope you get what you're looking for. God bless or something like that. And usually you won't ever get a reply back. But <laughs> And, you know, I, I think you have to look at it as if they're saying it, it's probably not your crowd anyway. Nothing you say is going to change that. There's nothing magical that's going to come out of your mouth that's going to change the way they feel. And I think a lot of people think that the longer they talk or the more they explain it, the more they'll be accepted. And it's, it's the exact opposite. I, I heard something, um, a saying, I, I can't remember who it is and I definitely don't want to plagiarize it, but they, they said that if you have lived your life where everybody likes you, it means you've never stood for anything. And I forgot who said it, but that really meant a lot to me. Um, it was probably president or something like that. I don't know, but I think it was a Kardashian. Um, that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So hey, I love, I love the same. <laughs> let Let's talk about one more thing about your dad, and of course he'll come up later on because he's he's spread throughout the book. But I want to talk about this right now because I want to come full circle to it later on. He told uh-huh. you as a kid uh, the story about two old men sitting on the porch. Uh-huh. Now him saying that to you in my eyes seem to affect you more than anything he could have ever told you in your life. Because point after point, even if you're doing it subliminally in the book, I think you go back to that over and over when you're talking about your trips, when you're talking about your rehabilitation, when you're talking about joining the teams again, all those kind of things, they all revert back to that one story. Yeah. Yeah. One, 100%. I never, um, the one thing that my dad really wanted to um drive home with me growing up is don't ever don't ever grow up with i wish i had of or i wish i would have don't get to that age because i remember my dad he's had a bunch of back surgeries he had a generator in his back and turtle brace on and all this stuff and i remember um you know just an ignorant kid i was like man that's that's gotta suck you're just gonna waste your whole life you know basically sat or in, in, a, in a chair because you can't do anything. And he's like, I, there's no waste at all. He said, I, I've done everything there is to be done. You know, I've, I, you know, even if it was wrong, I did it. You know, I've loved, I've had my heart broken. I've gave life. I've taken life. I've, you know, I, I've traveled around the world. I, everything that you can imagine that I wanted to do with myself, right, wrong, good, bad, um, or indifferent, um, I've done it. I've overcame almost, you know, almost killing myself. I've, I've dug myself out of those holes and I'm going to sit back now and I can actually, you know, I can enjoy the, um, the, the process and, and, and I can enjoy my, um, what I've done in life because I've literally done everything there is to do as, as, as I can, as a man, um, you know, have I made mistakes? I've made a lot of mistakes, but it, you'll never make a mistake if you never try. And if you never try, well, there's a bunch of, I wish I would have right there. And so my life has been spent um, making sure that, so I, I guess before I bring that up, so I believe, I, I believe in two things. Um, um, I believe that God knows um, and it's written when you're going to be born and when you're going to die. Those two things can't be changed. That was known before you were even born um or thought about that's in the book now so the beginning and the end is already written what you fill in the rest of those chapters with that's up to you and so and is that in the end is that book going to be worth reading that's up to you too and so i knew you know that if the opportunity was there regardless if i was scared or not um regardless if i succeeded or failed and i failed a lot in my life but I had some pretty um, sweet successes too. Um, It doesn't matter because I'm, because I'm building up those experiences and I'm living a life, a full life. And so in the end, when it does come, you know, my time, I'm going to be, I'm going to be happy with the life that I've lived. And I'm not going to look back with, I wish I would have, and I'm not going to look back and, and, and regret um, how I handled certain situations or not. And so that, that, that's basically what I've tried to do, um, from my dad's advice. Yeah. Well, I would, uh, I would say that 
I think you would agree that the wish I would have has come way too late in life. By the time you realize that you wish you would have, it's too late to do them. Yep, 100%. And it's a death sentence because, you know, you let life pass you by. Some of the richest people in the world have lived their life so containerized, not wanting to step out and take a chance because failure is, you know, is, is, is unacceptable. And, um, and because of that, they have no experiences. They have, I mean, hell, I, I can't even count how many extremely smart people, not myself, but extremely smart people have said like they failed a hundred times before they got that hundred and first success. It's, it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So let's talk about your military career. Now you've had a pretty interesting career. You've served in pretty much all the armed forces. Uh, I yeah. think you were just moving around to pick your favorite, but let's start with the first 1997 Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, that's uh, Naval boot camp. Yep. So you go, yeah, that's- you think the world, you got it by the, by the horns and uh, you go to Navy basic and you become uh, a Bolson's mate, right? Yep. Yeah. So Let's just talk about going there, your first thoughts, because this is the first time that you're away. I know how I felt the first time I was away at basic training and stuff like that. So let's just go through that. How is it different from your life before? How are you looking at it like, man, I got the rest of the world. I get to see the world. And then let's temper it with the reality that came into it. So when I was in high school, it was coming to that point to what are you going to do now? And my dad told me, you know, basically he said, hey, um, you know, you you can go out and you can get a job. Um, you know, you can um, you can go to college. But I mean, let's face it, you're not really college material um, and you don't really learn anything in college anyways. So, like, OK, he said, you can serve your country, um, you know, police officer, firefighter, whatever, serve your country. But I highly recommend the military because it's going to take you away from here. And it's going to put you in something that's going to re it's going to make you grow up. It's going to start giving you those life experiences. Like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So I've always been military minded just with my dad and his background and whatnot. So, you know, certain time in, in high school, uh, the recruiters start coming through and everything like that. So, you know, I take the, uh, whatever, whatever test it is that they tell you if you're a dumbass or not, I can't remember the SAT or the as fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I took the ASVAB <laughs> test and the, the Air Force guy, he was like, ooh, um, yeah, man, so we just don't have anything right now. It's like, oh, okay, cool. And it's, you know, it's, it's basically like he was telling me like, man, you're, <laughs> you're D-U-M dumb, boy. But, um, and so then, you know, it was like uh, the Army recruiter, he's like, yeah, we, I mean, your scores are really low and we don't have anything. This is, you know, this is the mid nineties. And he's like, we just, I mean, you want to be a Patriot missile guy? And I was like, no. So, like, okay. Yeah. We don't, we don't, I can get you into infantry in like eight months. He's like, nah, I, I can't wait that long. I need to get going. Then the Marine, he came through this school and he's just like, he was so angry and scary looking, just this buff guy. And he's got a big old dip in and he's spit and chew spit everywhere. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I don't want to be a Marine. You're scary. These guys are going to kill me. So he scared me out of wanting to be a Marine because he was so scary. And then the Navy guy came in and we're, you know, my buddy and I actually went to the Navy recruiter together and I was there as like emotional support for him or whatever. <laughs> and the, uh, the Navy recruiter is like, you want to, you want to go to exotic ports and see exotic women. And I'm over in the corner. Like, yeah, He's like, you want to, I want to be a Navy SEAL or an F-14 Tomcat pilot like Tom Cruise. And like, yeah. He goes, yeah, and you're you're going to sail. You're going to see the whole world. And, man, I can't even count how many beers sailors drink. And it's like, damn, that's kind of what I want to do. My friend's like, no, no, not looking for that. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll join. You guys, well, come on up. And so, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I, I could have put in a few words there or whatnot. But that's pretty much how it went down. So I joined the Navy. And um, I'm flying out to Illinois, uh, first time on an airplane, and I'm just like, all right, yeah, this, you know, I'm wrestled and, you know, went to state and football player and sucked, but I thought I was really good and all this other stuff. And get to Illinois and um, boot camp and uh, nobody cares. Matter of fact, 
not only do they not care, but you're the biggest piece of shit they've ever seen in their life. <laughs> and they just start screaming at you to get off this bus that I'm pretty sure is government owned, but they claim it's their bus. And then you're getting lined up and you're everything. And so I'm, I'm shocked. I'm man, I, I, no one's yelled at me except for my dad. It's a like, holy cow. And they're, you know, they're throwing shit around and there's trash cans flying around and they're grabbing bags and dumping them everywhere. And you're getting rushed in to get your haircut. And it was just, it was this huge culture shock for me. And I, yeah, it, I was like, well, I, I, I wrestled in state. Isn't that a big deal? No one cares. And so, yeah, all of a sudden I went from like, yeah, town of 1300 people. I'm pretty awesome. And, um, yeah, I show up in Illinois and, uh, great lakes and all of a sudden, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less than awesome. I'm actually, um, pretty much, well, not pretty much. I am 100% the worst thing that's ever happened to them. And I'm a piece of shit. And I was like, holy cow, what did I just, what did I just do? <laughs> You know, but when you get about halfway through, doesn't it feel good to be their piece of shit? I mean, you, you start to, it starts to be funny that you're their piece of shit and stuff like that. I, I, I enjoyed basic a lot. Now there was a specific duty in the Navy that really wasn't for you. And that was submarine duty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think you have to be, when I went to dive school, I think you have to be a special person to be on those submarines. Cause I went to dive school with a couple of the guys that were on the submarines and, and the stories they told about being on them, it just sounded miserable to me. And so yeah, I think I, you got to be special for those. Yeah. I, I got to Groton, Connecticut after boot camp. Um, somehow I got signed up for sub duty. I don't know. I don't know how, but, um, and I got to Groton and, they took us on a tour of a sub and I was like, nope, can't do this. I am not going on to a sub and basically said, all right, cool, man. Um, yeah, we glad we found out now instead of, you know, wasting a bunch of time. And so they're like, you're, uh, you're going to the fleet undesignated. It's like, wow, undesignated. That sounds really special. All right. This is going to be good. It's not special. You go to the fleet as a bosun's mate and, um, which is a great job. Um, couldn't do it now if I tried, but it definitely, let me tell you what, I, I learned how to work. Um, so they flew me out straight from, uh, Grant, Connecticut. I went to Istanbul, Turkey, and from Istanbul, I went out to the USS Shreveport that was dot or that was, um, anchored out. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, my, my adventures seeing the world started there. We went everywhere, but my job. Let me tell you about working 18 hours a day, either busting rust, prime, paint, or you're doing you're 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 doing the different watch stations, whether it's forward lookout, aft lookout, starboard lookout, port side lookout, helmsman, lee helmsman, whatever it is, and then oh, great, you're you're off. Okay, yeah, let's uh, we gotta. We, we, this is starting to rust up or this is, we need haze gray underway and all this. And man, it was just, you worked, you worked hard, but, um, and you live like your living space. It's you had a coffin rack <laughs> and a bed <laughs> and you stack three high. And then within a foot of you is the next stack of three high. And then that's about 60 guys in a, I would give it a 20 person tent. You know, and it's not a tent, it's an area, but, and then I, you know, fast forward throughout my military time and I would hear people, you know, complaining about the living conditions. I was like, you have no clue. <laughs> so October 12th, 2000, USS Coles bombed, um, rips a 40 by 60 foot gash in the mm -hmm. port side on your ship. So I was on the Camden, at the, the Camden at the time, but you guys, I was on the USS Camden when all that happened. But you guys go over there to help out, right? Yeah. So we um, we were going through uh, the Straits of Hormuz, I think it was. Um, and the we were about eight hours from the Gulf of Aden when the distress call went out, when the, when the USS Cole was hit. And so we went full steam ahead. And uh, we were the second ship on scene next to the Donald Cook. And I was a rescue swimmer at the time. And so... Um, I was part of the first boarding parties um, that our ship sent out. 
and yeah, it was, it was just bucket brigades and, um, and I'm trying to keep the ship, um, from, you know, from sinking because the, you know, we were having issues with the submersible pumps. We already had flooding in, in the main compartment of the chow hall, which is they hit during chow hours. So that's where all the, um, that's where the majority of the casualties came from. Um, 17, I'm pretty sure. And, um, and yeah, so it was, it, it was bucket brigades for the first couple of nights to keep the ship, um, afloat. And then after, after that, it was, yeah, uh, uh, it was the unfortunate task of, um, coming through the rubble to find, uh, parts of bodies and whatnot. So. There's one thing that it, it talks about in the book that you never forgot. And that was the smell, um, when you get yeah. there, um, when you got to Afghanistan, did that same thing happen? That same smell, that same, I guess the best way to describe it would be almost like a cloud of, of death. I mean, mm -hmm. It, it, did you notice the same things in other countries that you went to, or was that specific to that one incident in your career? So the coal was pretty um, specific because of you, you have the diesel fuel, the salt water, the, the, the flesh burning flesh, and then it's October in the middle East. So it's still hot. So rotting flesh. So you combine all those together um, Afghanistan, um, yeah, rotten, uh, that, that still, that would still really like, oh, yep, there's a body, but adding in the salt water, diesel smell, um, all that other stuff, because, um, the, the, the sense of smell is one of our strongest, most memory producing, um, senses that we have. And, um, don't quote me on that. I'm not really, a no, I, I think you're but, correct on that, but yeah, there I've been, I've, I've had a couple of situations that. Um, I've smelt something that was similar to it and it was like right back on the coal again. It was, <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but yeah, it, it was, it, it was, it was one of the first salvos in, in the war on terror and, um, to, to them actually attacking a military target. And, um, and it just, I mean, yeah, it's, it actually opened my eyes, not to, not to death, but it opened my eyes to, someone's trying to kill us because they hate us. Why do you hate me? I don't, I don't understand this, you know? And so, yeah, that, that, that kind of, yeah, that kind of drove it home. Cause you can, you, you know, you, you can get caught up in the wash all you want about, you know, um, the, the boot camp cadences with kill, 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 kill. And that's great and all, but you actually have to be a part of that for that to, for it to get driven home. Like, Oh, got it. And yeah, in, um, in 2000, October, 2000 is when I was like, Oh, okay. People want to kill us. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah, it changed my life. So. Yeah. And you think about it, like when you went through the nineties, that's when I went to basic was in the nineties, uh, that a lot of that cadence and everything, but other than maybe the Gulf war, that was really the only action that a lot of the military was having, uh, and had yep. had for quite a while. So, I think the mindset changed when you went to basic. I remember there was a couple of uh, drill sergeants that had been in like Panama, uh, Desert Storm, uh, a couple things like that. But it was it was pretty few and far between to see people like that. Um, they were mm -hmm. they were kind of those guys were either at the end of their career or uh, kind of the middle where they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do. One more thing that I wanted to talk about about the Navy before we move on to the Air Force. This you talk about the failures that you've had, um, and yeah. this was, I think, one of the first main ones in your life. And and I don't mean to say that to sound rude or anything like that. The reason I say it like that is because it seemed from the book that you learned so much about yourself and about failure in that area. You know, you had mm -hmm. seen little bits and pieces of it, like you said, when you got to basic, and and you were like, "Well, I was really cool there," and they're like, "But you're a piece of shit here." I think you really learned a lot about yourself when you went to SEAL training. So if we can yeah. talk about that a little bit and what your mind state was at in during that process. Yeah. So I, I was basically kind of um, going off of my athletic, what I thought was ability. And, you know, I had gone through rescue swimmer school and I was like, so I know how to swim. This should be no problem at all. Just a you know, the, and, and I, and I sucked into this, like the hardest part of buds is getting here after you get here. It's easy. It's like, Oh man, well, this is great. So I was a Naval reservist at the time. 
And when I got to Bud's, I was looking at Bud's as a six month long suck fest. Like I got to get through six months. And um, that was my first downfall was because I was looking at it as a six month course and not chopping it up into one evolution at a time, which that lessons that I learned from Bud's actually helped me be successful in, 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 um, in selection and the Q course. But um, so going through Bud's, um, I had a leg injury and I ended up getting pneumonia and we're going through hell week and I get pulled and, and it's basically like, Hey, um, you're going to roll back. And I was like, I can't go through that shit again. And so I gave up on myself. And that's what that that's one of the biggest things that I look back on that I've, I've had to battle with not being ashamed of, you know, what I've done in the past. Um, that right there has, has bothered me a lot throughout my entire life that I didn't, because I wasn't looking at it as one evolution. I was looking at it as I got to go back through this six months again, when I was only at week seven or week six and a half, whatever it was. And so instead of me looking at it like, oh man, this is nothing. Um, instead I allowed it, I allowed that to, um, that setback to become a failure. I didn't even look at it as a setback. It was 100%. I'm not good enough. What did I do wrong? How come I'm not good enough? Why? Poor me. It's not fair and all this other shit. And once that took me over, I was just like, I, I'm not going through that crap again. And, um, and, and yeah, that was one of the biggest lessons that I learned in my life about, about failure and giving up. And there's, you know, I mean, there, I, I believe that people fail a lot. Um, and it's not necessarily that they quit on themselves, but there's a difference between failure and quitting. And that was one of the first times in my life that I really remember I quit on myself and it still bothers me to this day that I did that, but I've learned so many lessons from giving up like that from, you know, whether it's, um, looking at everything as a whole picture or chopping it up into little bite-sized pieces, um, whether, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, try just getting that mental mindset straight, like, Hey man, shit happens and there's nothing you can do about it. So man up, quit being a little baby and feeling sorry for yourself and move on. And so I've learned a lot from the, uh, the, you know, what I went through at Bud's and again, I mean, I don't like to look back and think that I've ever, you know, gave up on myself with anything, but I did there and, I could say I've learned so much from it all I want, but it still, still has a tender. It's still a little tender subject. <laughs> I'll get over it. Maybe another 40 years, probably. Well, it's funny. Cause I wrote, when you talk about the poor me in my notes, I wrote, this is where the invention of the poor me excuses happen because it seemed like mm -hmm. the first time in your life where you started talking about it. And you even, it was interesting to me, went so far back that you were like, well, I grew up poor and I had a shitty life growing up. So that's why I failed. And and it was amazing yeah. that you reached that far back to find a reason of why you were, why you were at that point right then. That was a super interesting part of the book to me. Um, well, it was, it, it, I mean, it, it was, it boiled down to one thing. I was refusing to look at the overwhelming, um, like the elephant in the room that I gave up. There had to be a reason. What was the reason? It couldn't just be as simple as I just quit. There had to be a reason. What is it? No, there is no reason. <laughs> you got rolled back and you decided you were done. That's, that's the reason. And so, yeah, I did. I mean, all those excuses. And that's what I try. I don't think I portrayed it quite the right way in the book. And trust me, I've definitely heard some remarks on it. But that was what I was trying to portray is I was looking for every excuse in the world to make up for flat out. The situation was you gave up, dude. Move on. Well, what have people said then? Because when you say that, that, that you think it was portrayed wrong, can you go into that a little bit? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but I've had a few remarks of like, man, it sure seems like you were trying to find every excuse in the book for the simple fact of matter that you just couldn't hack it. And that, and that kind of is like, yeah, you're right, man, but I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but you know, it's the, stuff like that, little, little yeah, subtle I, jabs, little subtle jabs like that. And that's when I'm just like, all right, man, don't, 
don't get too caught up into this because in the end they are correct, but I don't think they actually read the book. They just listened to a podcast that it was brought up on or something like that. So also, unless they're wearing a trident, they can go fuck themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, you have to get to that point in your life where you know, you're like, you're telling me what I can hack. Are you wearing one? If not, you know, beat feet. Yeah. Cause... I mean, those, those men wearing tridents, those are, those are some hard dudes, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, yeah, but it's, but it's anything it's, if you're wearing a Ranger tab or you're wearing a, spe- <clears throat> excuse me, a special forces, green beret, a Navy seal, mm-hmm. whatever it is until you've been there and done that. And I speak from, I was in the military, nothing even close to what you did. Um, I speak from a law enforcement point of view, unless you've been there and done that, you have mm-hmm. no right to talk. You can have yeah. your opinion because that's what's great about America, but you really have no basis in what you're saying. And until you've walked yeah. a mile in their shoes, you have no idea what it was. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, Bud's Bud's is that one course. I mean, win, lose, or draw, it'll stay with you the rest of your life. <laughs> it is It is. It is that brutal. You will it, – it, it'll become a part of you. So much to the point to where it actually buds help me pass selection and the Q course. Oh, nice. Well, let's mm-hmm. talk about um, the the complete opposite of that. Let's talk about the Air Force for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you you go over into the Air Force. You choose uh, ammunition specialist. Now, once yeah. again, you could talk about uh, you know you could be down on this job or or make it as basic as you can. But once again, it's that even keel. Hey, we're a family. I love this job. It was a great time doing what I did. And I only want to quickly kind of go over it because there's not a lot to the Air Force part of it. Um, But it's just one of those things where another point in your life where you're like, yeah, I'll ride this out for a while, see what it's like, and then I'll move on from there. Yeah, the the Air Force, um, one of the best years in my military life was an ammo troop in Korea at Osan Air Force Base, Korea. I, that, whenever I have grandkids and I get old enough to where my wife can't beat the crap out of me anymore, I will be telling some stories about Osan Air Force Base, Korea as an ammo troop. Um, I had a blast, but um, as much fun as I had and as much as I did, like I went, I, I deployed to Iraq as an ammo troop and I saw how important our job was as far as every aircraft that we were loading was coming back Winchester. And it was like, man, we just loaded all these aircraft a few hours ago and they're back empty. It's like, man, we're, we're doing something. And you'd get to see the videos every now and then it's like, holy cow, we loaded those bombs. And it was just cool. It was really cool to have that part that was actually um, a shaping factor for the, for the conflict and whatnot. But I wasn't on the ground dropping the bombs. I wasn't on the ground um, watching the bombs drop. I wasn't on the ground as a troop that needed those bombs dropped because we were in a hellacious firefight. And so as much as I, I, I absolutely loved my job as an ammo troop, and I do know for sure that um, our job was so critical in both conflicts because we were putting bombs on aircrafts, um, there was such a huge part of me missing. And that was that I, I really had no victories. I, you know, I, I, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted that. I wanted to be on the front line. I wanted to know, I wanted to answer that question that every man has. What will I do when someone's trying to kill me? And I want to know. And I believe that men since the beginning of time has been chasing this question. How will I react when someone's trying to kill me? And I was, I'm no different. So yeah, as great as a job that I had, it's, I was still missing that. Well, I think the one good point, uh, and I'm sure there were lots of them was this is kind of your first interaction with green berets, correct? Yeah, it was, uh, (laughs) it was at the gym in Kirkuk. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like everything, I say it a lot on the show. I feel like everything happens for a reason. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like the seal thing didn't work out. You went to the air force and who do you meet while deployed a green beret? What do you finally become a green beret? I mean, like, I feel like there was a, 
I don't want to say a predetermined path for you, but I have a feeling that you were getting ushered down a road a certain way. So, yeah, it was, it was funny because my dad, when I joined the Navy, he kept saying, like, why don't you wait six, eight months and, and go join the Army? Because my dad's, you know, former uh, uh, Huey, uh, Huey crew chief in the Army. So it's like, go join the Army or whatnot. And my dad had worked with uh, Mac V. Sog. Um, he was not a Green Beret, but he worked, he was, a, he was an attachment. And so, it was, you know, that was, that was always something that was brought up quite a bit about his time in Vietnam, um, working with the Green Berets and whatnot like that. But it was, it was always this, this unattainable, like, yeah, that's no, they're Green Berets. And, and, um, and so, yeah, and Kirk Cook, we were at the gym and this guy, I, I forgot what time? I, I don't know. It was like, I don't know. It was at night sometime. But anyways, he was like, "Hey man, can you give me a spot?" And you know these guys from a mile away because they have the beards and they and everyone like, oh god, that's. And then you and you know when they walk by you, you tell all the stories about what you have no clue what you're talking about, but you're fairly certain is true because of some movie you've seen or somebody else's whisper of something or something or something. And so that was that guy. And, and we got to talking and it was, and I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm in, I'm in the air force, whatnot. And he goes, yeah, we, we got a guy in our company that was in the air force. He transferred over and, um, and went blue to green. And now as a green brain, I was like, you can do that. So just that little seed that was planted right there, even though I didn't do anything about that for another uh, four years, that seed that was planted led up to the moment when I was at the personnel office and I saw this poster on the wall that had a half um, airman and a half soldier, you know, the same man, but they're in two different uniforms. And it said, go blue to green. And if you're in one of these career fields, you qualify for it. And I was like, oh crap, that's my career field right there. And so that conversation, just that little seed that was planted led all the way up four years later to what ended up eventually happening. So you get out of the Air Force, you go into the Army, uh, you go to Army basic training. Now, you've been through two two basic trainings before this. I don't know because I was never in the Navy. I was never in the Air Force. So I don't know compared to how hard their basics are. But in reading the book, it seemed like you kind of just breezed through basic. I So Fort Benning... I had a blast. I was just coming off of, of a divorce, a nasty divorce. And I was able to throw myself into um, this, this training course. Like when I went blue to green, I'm literally in the Air Force one day. A week later, I'm in the Army. And I just, I buried myself into it. And it was, it was awesome. I was, I was, I was learning how to Army. And um, Fort Benning was just, it, it was this, it, it was this, um, it was the confidence boost I needed, but it was the distraction that I needed. And the more I would think about, you know, this divorce that I just went through, I would bury myself even further in a training. And, um, and I just, um, I loved everything all the way up until we went straight across the street to the airborne towers. <laughs> then I was not happy anymore. Yeah, I you're in one. You're what's that club that you don't like jumping out of planes? You're you you don't seem like a, a an airborne guy to me that you like it that much. No, I absolutely hate it. Yeah, <laughs> I so, hate every bit of it. So you went airborne, uh, eighteen X ray, correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, you got eighteen to twenty four months of training. You got infantry basic, infantry advanced, airborne, special forces selection, special forces Q. Now. At any point in this, are you thinking like, okay, I've got to get through this. I can't let it be a SEAL thing. I can't let it be this. I'm kind of I'm kind of at the end. I've got to prove myself right here. Are you of that mind state or are you just kind of taking it in stride? So the lessons that I learned at BUDS, which was not to look at the entire Q course, because if you look at the, um, the entire Q course from flash to bang, at the minimum, you're looking at 14 to 15 months. So 
I, I, I learned such a valuable lesson at Bud's as, as it, it was, you know, one evolution at a time. And so I actually was just going evolution by evolution by evolution because I refused to look at the entire length in a whole. And I never got tunnel vision. Like I can honestly tell you graduation snuck up on me because I really, I, I refused to look at it as a whole because I know what it did to me when I was at Bud's. And so those lessons that I learned there paved the way for me to be successful in the Q course because I was always looking at mastering that next evolution and not, all right, I got to get through this three months here and this four months here and this four months here. And, you know, I wasn't looking at it like that. It was one evolution at a time. And that was one of the most, I mean, I still, I still use that valuable lesson that I learned um, today. When it when it comes to you know dissecting problems or whatnot, it's like let me dissect it a piece at a time, because I can't I can't take this whole thing on at once. So, I you know, and I've talked to people about that. I've had another guy on here that he did like the uh, meal method. So he was like, I got to get to breakfast, I got to get to lunch, I got to get to dinner, and that's how he made it through all the training that he did. It was just by meal. Like I know we go to here yeah. and then we eat and then we're going to eat here. So I do it like that. And, and I think that's the only way is to, you can't consume a whole thing. You have to chop it up in pieces like you did. Now you said that seal training was something that will never leave you. I want to talk mm -hmm. about the, uh, 18 day gut check on the selection, uh, same kind of way, or is it different? Did, did it appear different? Because what it seems like to me in reading your book and and seeing everything, SEALs, they're very, when you're in BUDS training, they're very in your face. They're driving you through the motions at the Q or excuse me, the selection course and stuff. They're treating you like an adult. Here's your objective. Go out, do it. You have whatever time limit. And that's it. There was, yeah, there was very little yelling and screaming. And that actually was worse for me and then having somebody yell and scream at me. And the reason for that is, is because you would be doing an evolution and a guy would look straight at you, an instructor would look straight at you, pull out his clipboard and just write something down. Well, okay, that's fine with you and I just sitting here and we both, we've got a good meal in us. We're both probably hydrated a little bit, good to go. No sleep, barely any food and, um, and, and you're cold and you're, and you're, and you're wet, add all that together. And now all of a sudden that little jot on the clipboard. And I learned out later, sometimes they didn't even write anything down, but, um, it was, it was, it was devastating, man. Did I, because it shows you how your mind will, will fuck you more than a guy yelling and screaming at you. Cause if you're getting yelled and screamed at, okay, you're getting attention. And if you're not getting yelled and screamed at, well, why am I like, what's going on? Did I mess up? Am I, you know, so, and then the whiteboard, the whiteboard was another big one was that you would come to the whiteboard and it would say something simple as, you know, run for an undetermined amount of time or undetermined distance. And it, it would say some other stuff on it. Well, then you would start to, you would start to like, well, what do they mean? And you would start to try and dissect what is on that whiteboard and guys would actually, they would mind screw themselves so bad that they would just quit there at the whiteboard, which actually benefited me being, being pretty dumb is because I'd read the whiteboard. is like, all right, Roger that run this way and follow the cones until they tell me to stop. Good to go. I'm going to run this way and follow the cones. I didn't have the, the mental capacity to think about what it was saying. It was very easy for me because I just looked at the whiteboard but I would hear it. I would hear the guys like, oh, no, no, no. I think this is what they mean because they would leave it open-ended. And they did that for a reason. You know, who can follow directions and stuff like that. So so the really big hands-off approach, like there was one incident or not incident, interval that happened that um, we are, you know, we're lined up and we're waiting for direction. And it's like 15 hours and we're just in these lines, no direction. Well, what do you think? Cold, wet, hungry, tired um, guys. What do you think is going on? <laughs> the talk starts happening and guys and guys quit during that 15 hours of just it said just line up in formation and wait for further direction. Guys quit during that. 
It's like, holy cow. And it's not because um, there's a weaker mindset here or that or that. They know that it was just I this uh, selection, although it was extremely physically tough, um, selection was more of a mental game than I think Bud's was. Um if you went to buds with the right mindset, with the hard mindset, like one evolution at a time, I'm going to do this regardless. Um, Unless it was a catastrophic injury, which happens all the time there. But unless it was that, you're probably going to be pretty good to go. In the Q course, um, the mental aspect of it is like, holy cow. And guys, um, at at the very end of selection, we were on our trek. And I'm pretty sure you've had guys talk about the trek before on here, but we're on our trek and our trek ended up being um, 32 plus miles. So we're getting ready to finish our trek and you can see they, they, they have the, they have the finish line and it's bright lights or, you know, the floodlights are beaming down on it because you can see it from three miles away. And they know that's going to really like students are going to look at it and be like, yes, we're almost there. And it's so you see these beams of light and all of a sudden, you know, you've been you've been rucking for however many hours like we're almost there. It's almost over with. And you have given it everything you got. And then right when you get to the finish line, the whiteboard says, keep going. We will tell you when to stop. How many guys do you think quit right there? A ton. So that's that's what I'm talking about. It was very big. It, it was a mental minefield. Um, because you're constantly wondering like, what do you mean? Do it like this. I don't understand what you're, you know, but I had no bad habits. I wasn't former infantry. I wasn't former ranger. I wasn't former combat arms. So if they were like, do this like this, all right, Roger that do it like this. Now do it like this. Okay. Roger that do it like this, you know? And so that actually, um, that helped me out a lot and then breaking it up into one evolution at a time. Yeah. And that's the advice I give guys now is like, don't look at it as a whole. You will not pass if you do that. (laughs) So you make it through, you become a green beret, you start deploying. Um, Life is good. You're, you're finally doing what you've always wanted to do. You can see what you do when another man is trying to take your life. So everything's going great. And then the day comes where a catastrophic injury comes to you. So I want you to walk us through that day, where you're at, where your mind's at, beginning, during, and after. Because I have a lot of questions about this, but I want you to tell the story first, and then we're going to get to uh, where we got to from there. Okay. So it was September 11th, 2010, and we had kicked off this mission to clear the uh, Chutu Valley. The Chutu Valley is along the Helmand River in Aruzgan province. Um, basically, we were split in the border between Helmand and Aruzgan. Um, the Chutu Valley in, in that time, it was, I mean, we were getting intel of 15 to 2,000 fighters um, in the valley waiting for us to come. It was going to be a major clearance operation with an entire company. So um, I think we were bringing in the Valley five ODAs, commandos, um, the whole works. And um, our job was the Southern part. We were going to, we were going to clear the Southern part and start moving North. And so um, as an 18 Charlie, uh, my job was, you know, when deployed to Afghanistan is counter IED. And so uh, amongst other things, but you know, (laughs) out on, out on patrol, it's counter IED. So we, uh, we kick off. It's it's like it's like 10, 10 30 p.m. Um, September eleventh, and we get to our first our our last correction, our last covered and concealed before we go down to the first village of I want to say it was Gram or yeah it was one of those. Anyways, so we get to last cover and concealed, and you know we hold up for a minute waiting for the different um, for the different um, movement elements around the valley to get into place. Cause it wasn't just us. And so all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's uh, September 12th now, zero one or whatever kickoff. So we start moving in and our, my ODA is broken up into like four different little um, squads. You have two Americans and your Afghans that are with you. So my job was to clear the first, the, the main um, first three compounds. 
that you come up on to clear the compounds, get a foothold. So we have a C2, a place for the C2 element to, to, to basically um, stand up. And then we're going to um, continue operations after that. But we need to get this foothold before daybreak because if we're out, at, if we're out, um, you know, as as the sun starts coming up, we're silhouetting bad news. So we get we get about 25 meters from the first set of compounds, and I'm like, okay, just like we rehearsed, Nick, and that was our turf. Was Nick, all right, tell our guys, let's go down and clear the first compound because at this point in the war. Um, Afghans are kind of leading the way, not even close, but that's the theory. <laughs> so it's like, okay, Hey, tell them to tell them, let's clear the first set of compounds. So, um, Nick, you know, he, he whispers over cause it's still noise light discipline whispers over. And, um, I'm, I'm talking to the other American with me, just whispering like, all right, Hey, this is what's going to happen. Strategizing. And I turn back around and they're just standing there. It's like, okay. Hey, Nick, did you? Hey man, did you tell them or not? And he goes, yeah, they said they don't want to go. I was like, tell them, go clear those first three compounds. They don't want to go. They say it's too dangerous. You have better training and better weapons. The Americans should go first. It's like, well, yeah, man, if this is, if we were in Texas, I'd, I'd agree with you, but we're in Afghanistan. So this is your country. Go fight for it, man. I mean, <laughs> kind of thing or else, you should have joined the Taliban. They, they got a great medical plan or whatever. I don't know. So they won't move. So I, I look back to tell my teammate, I'm like, hey, man, we got a problem. These guys are not going to move unless we go first. And he grabs me and he goes, go get Nick away from that fucking door. And none of this area has been cleared. And we've seen animals step on IEDs in this area. So we know it's like, oh, man, that's not good. So I, I take off after him trying to stand and or trying to step in where he had stepped. And he's at the first, um, he's at the breach point of the first compound and he's, and he's trying to wave the guys down there, you know, Afghan Rambo is like, come on guys, but it's still noise and light discipline. So he's just waving frantically and they don't have nods. So it, it's just stupid. So I grab a hold of him. It's like, dude, really stupid move, wrong move, move back. And, you know, he has a little argument like, hey, we're right here. We can clear this compound. Come on, me and you, let's do this. Like, move back now. This isn't the right time and place. We need to regroup. And so I pulled him away from the breach point. And for me, and so now I'm going to I'm gonna provide security while he moves back because the worst thing you can do is turn your back to the unknown. Uh, that's how you take a burst of 762 round. And so I'm I'm pulling security on the breach point while he's moving back. And I see something flicker and move out of the corner of my eye in the compound. It's like, well, what is that? And I'm a new guy. <laughs> so curiosity killed the cat. I stepped inside the breachway to, to look around the corner of what was moving, hoping because I was bloodthirsty. I wanted to kill something. And, um, and I stepped on the pressure plate inside the breachway. And so yeah, as I stepped right in, it's just boom. But the weird thing about it was, so the whole valley, according to my teammates, the whole valley shook, but I only heard a little pop. And then it was this flash of light, this huge flash of light, but this little pop. And next thing I know, I'm on my back and I'm, 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 I'm trying to breathe, but I can't breathe. There's so much dust and ammonia in the air. And I'm like, man, I'm going to suffocate. I need to get out of here. What happened? I, I don't know what just happened. Um, and so, because your mind can't comprehend IED, I didn't step on it and be like, aha, I know exactly what happened. I stepped on an IED. No, I, I couldn't comprehend it. And so I'm trying to breathe, but I can't. And so I try and stand up and I keep falling over. I'm not in pain yet, but I'm getting pissed. And so, you know, and so I, I grab my gun and I'm trying to point it inside the entryway because I don't know if someone threw a grenade or, or whatnot but I can't stand up. And then, and so I'm like, all right, calm down, calm down, calm down. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It doesn't hurt at this point, but something's wrong. And so, um, I can hear like echoes of people trying to say something to me, like they're yelling down a long hallway, but I still, it's just, I can't comprehend anything. So as the dust starts to clear a little bit, I start to, I start to look down and now 
the sun, I mean, the sun's not coming up, but the light in the sky has made it. So, you know, that time when it's like, uh, do I need nods? Do I not? Uh, yeah, I'm going to flip them up. I can see it was that time in the morning. And so the dust starts to clear a little bit and I look down and my boot is at a 90 degree angle to my leg. And I'm like, huh. And I remember thinking, I don't remember taking my boot off. Why would my boot be looking like that? Because again, funny enough, your brain cannot comprehend that you stepped on an IED. It just, it doesn't work that way. And so I still can't figure out what is going on here, man. And the pain, it, it, it hasn't hit me yet, but I can't move. And so I, I'm looking at my boot. And so I grab from behind my knee, my right knee, and I pull my leg up and my boot flops over. And I see these two pearly white objects sticking out of my pant leg. And they're so white. I've never seen anything that white before that I can't comprehend what they are. Well, what is this? And then all of a sudden it really, it starts to sink in. Like that's my tib and my fib. And I stepped on an IED. And so, you know, I put my leg back down and I'm, I'm, you know, I have my assault pack on. And so I'm kind of, I'm kind of sitting on my, my, you know, my back in with my assault pack back there. And I'm just like trying to get the words out. I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I can hear people yelling and it's starting to get clearer out. You know, people don't move, don't move, you know, stuff like that. And um, I was like, I'm hit, I'm hit. And uh, then I was like, this can't be happening. Maybe if I just straighten my leg out, everything will go back to the way it was. Maybe this is a dream and, and this isn't for real. And so I tried to move my boot to straighten it out to my leg. And that's when the pain hit me like something I've never felt before in my life. It was absolutely excruciating. And, um, and so I'm there and now the echoes are starting to become more clear and I'm trying to get the words out, but you know, my eyes, I'm just caked in dust everywhere. Um, the echoes are starting to get more clear. And I remember the guy that was with me is like, don't move, Ryan, we're coming to get you. And I remember saying, where the fuck do you think I'm going to go? I'm hit. I'm hit. And so that was, that was pretty cool. I, I, I gotta say for the situation, that was a pretty cool punchline I threw in there on him, but, um, I'm laying there and I remember, um, he was like, Ryan, you know, you need to get your tourniquet on. We can't get to you right now. We're trying to clear up to you because we did what you're supposed to do. You don't rush to failure. Where there's one IED, there's five. And the Taliban know that because we value life over anything. And we will, we will lose 100 men to bring one back. And so they're like, Roger that. We're going to put 100 IEDs out here and see who we can hit. Well, we know that. And so they were trying to clear up to me. But I remember him saying, <clears throat> you know, Ryan, um, we, we can't get to you, man. You need to get your tourniquet on. Stay awake, stay awake. And I remember I looked back out of the corner of my eye and I could see just this frantic stuff happening. And you can see guys putting security up and stuff like that. But they felt like they were like a mile away from me. And I, I, I remember I, I laid my head back and I was like, I'm, I'm going to die here today. And um, I had my tourniquet in my hand, but I just, I had no strength left to, le left to do anything. And I just remember, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to die here along the Hellman river today. This is, this is it. And, and so, yeah, that, well, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to read your quote from the book. It said, okay. <laughs> this is it. I'm going to die in this shithole village in Afghanistan. You asked for forgiveness and then felt calm. Yeah. You yeah. think it's because you asked yeah. for forgiveness or that you were chewing on a fentanyl lollipop and uh, and when I say chewing, you chewed it up like you weren't supposed to do. So that didn't get to me until our medic got to me. Okay, so you're still sitting there just calm now. You're in pain, but you're calm. I'm in pain, but I think that I think the shock was starting to take over. Right. But um, I do. Like, I mean, we're not on a religious podcast here, but I do have you know, regardless of how much I cuss and, you know, I drink some whiskey and stuff like that, but I do have a religious conviction. And I do know that, you know, I was at the weakest point of my entire life. And, and, and I knew like, I, I, I knew from my upbringing that, you know, I mean, I'm going, I'm going to heaven if, if everything goes down. So, 
Um, but I did. I mean, I, I remember just like, man, I'm, <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes in my life and I'm sorry. And that was very calming for me, even though the pain was excruciating. But yeah, it was, I mean, it was, I, I had a lot of shock kicking in, but I mean, people can, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just my beliefs. I believe, I believe God was like, Hey man, I'm about ready to teach you a lesson because your life is you're, you're, you are off track right now, bro. I'm about ready to teach you a lesson. That's going to get you back on track. I need this to bring you to the brink of death, but you're going to learn this lesson the hard way because you are dumb and we're going to learn this together. And that's just my, that that's my opinion on it. Um, you know, no, I, I absolutely yeah. agree with you. I, I wonder, is there anything, if you don't mind, because it's, it's a little personal. Do you, you remember anything in particular that you asked for forgiveness for? I, I, had, I, I had made a mess out of myself up to that point. Um, you know, I'd been married twice up to that point. I wasn't a good husband my first time. Um, the second time, you know, I kind of kind of got what was coming to me. Um, but I, I, I had this knack of just tearing people down around me. Um, and I, and I wasn't, I, I was, I, I just, I, I was still a kid. I wasn't, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't take control over my life. I was letting life live me. And even though I had made, you know, I had that great victory with, with graduating and becoming a green beret and all this other stuff. I still, um, I was still struggling um, ment- or personally, you know, and my faith in God and, and, um, and just, and, and, and just being a responsible man. So it was very easy. Like, Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a green beret. I got everything going for me, but no, um, that, that wasn't the case at all. And I needed, I needed a wake up call. Cause I was, I, I was on a bad, I was on a bad path and I still, you know, I was, I, I just, I just destroyed everything around me. And yeah, I think, I think 2000, I think September 12th, 2010 was, was the day that God said, look, man, um, I, I'm, I'm done playing with you. Um, this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to, I'm going to force you to grow up because you just won't do it on your own kid. And I, uh, yeah, because I have, I have, I'm not saying I'm this, this God has these great plans for me, anything like that, but I have bigger things for you. And you, you need this because you are going down a bad path right now. And, and so I do, I mean, I, I really do believe that it was the wake up call. It, I I tell people all the time, getting blown up was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So. Well, I don't know about one of the best things that ever happened to you because it it did a lot of damage. Um, I was looking through, um, when I, after I had read it, I had to go back and I had to get certain numbers and stuff. So after all this happens, you get medevac out, they move you around, they move you to Germany. They move you to Walter Reed for a little bit. And finally down to, um, Brook army medical down in Texas, right? Yes. So total, you had 26 reconstructive surgeries. Uh, 28. Mm-hmm. 20 okay so i have 26 so there must have been two that happened after that but they kept putting mm-hmm. you into medically induced comas i mean like it's crazy how long are you spending from that happening to you're in brook army medical uh how long are we talking and how many surgeries up until you arrive not not necessarily why you were there but up until you arrive so <laughs> that that's going to be hard to answer. I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so from, from the battlefield, I was first medevac to TK Terran Cout. And, um, that's when I, that's when I first started undergoing the debridement surgeries. Um, however many they did there, I, I'm not sure. And then the metal rod. And then, um, from Terran Cout, I went to calf. Something else happened at calf surgery wise stabilization um, to fly because I something happened on the flight from TK to calf. We can't stabilize on the fly to bath, so we got to do something or another. Um, and then I get to bath, 
and then more surgeries to stabilize me to fly to Germany. So I was, I, I spent five or six days in, um, in Afghanistan to stabilize me to fly, which I heard is, is a long time. Um, once you get hit, I heard that that's a pretty long time. Well, fast forward years later, um, I'm back in group and everything like that. And I had met one of the nurses that worked on me, um, at CAF and she was like, Oh yeah, you expired like twice, dude. It's like, really? Or TK, maybe it was TK, but I didn't think I was that bad, but something had happened. And she was, she was telling me about it and, you know, she got emotional about it, but I, I just, I don't remember, but I know there was a bunch of surgeries that happened to get me out of Afghanistan to long stool. And then I remember a few surgeries, I'm pretty sure in long stool. And I had three strands of E. coli. I was just a mess. Um, Cause as you know, our, our ODA, like our main source of shower was the Hellman river and, and villagers were shitting in the Hellman river up river and we're bathing in it. So um, yeah, I, I was just, I probably had worms and some other stuff, but people don't realize that's VSO right there. That's, that's VSO. Um, but I, it, it, it could have been 15 surgeries, um, before they actually got me to the, to, uh, Brooks army medical center, uh, where I underwent the actual limb salvage portion of it. I want to talk since you mentioned the nurse, <laughs> I have a question mm-hmm. for you. So you had a habit of going commando in the hospital, um, <laughs> <laughs> But they had to remove your gown for vitals. Uh, you had a nurse, and I'm I'm really hoping it's the nurse that you ran into that uh, said, Mr. Hendrickson, we're trying hard to fix the thermostat in this room, but as I can see with what you have down there, <laughs> that it must be extremely cold in here. I'll work on getting it fixed, sir. So, no, different nurses. This, this nurse turned out to be my favorite nurse in at Bamsey. I loved her to death, but she, she was a no shit woman. Um, she had worked in the nursing facility for a lot of years. Um, she was, she was a Southern woman and she didn't take crap from anybody. Um, but it wasn't this, you know, Oh, I'm going to go tell my supervisor. It was the fact that she could dish it out better than any soldier in the entire world could give it. She was a master and, um, and I love her to this day, <laughs> but yeah, she, uh, I, I just, I was trying to, I don't know. I was a lot of, a lot of methadone and, and, um, fentanyl and all this other stuff, but I thought it would be really cool that when the nurses would come in, I just bam sheets off and, and you'd see the young nurses, they wouldn't know what to do and everything like that. And it's like, Hey, don't worry. I'm, um, with all the drugs that I'm on, I can't use it anyways, but hit me up in about nine months, you know, stuff like that. Just dumb. But she, I mean, she didn't care. She was just like, yeah, I figured, uh, figured the stereotypes are right. That's uh that's all you're packing down there. It's like, what? Wait, hold on. That's not very nice. <laughs> you know, but she was, she was my favorite. I, I loved her. So. There was one other person that, that was important that showed up in the hospital and, and was huge to your recovery, and that was your dad. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting when you described that he came to the hospital and he came in and looked at you, you looked at him. He didn't really hug you or anything like no. that. And you were like, yeah, it's just him. Yeah, we don't we, we don't hug. It's, it's handshakes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I guess reading it when, when you read it and you look at it, you're, you're just like the way you describe it is there was no hugs or anything, but you could tell that he was uh, like proud of you and what you had done and everything that you had made it through so far. Yeah. So when, when dad got to the hospital, it, it was weird too, because you'd expect a lot more of a, of a, like a, very emotional encounter because son just got blown up. Oh, by the way, we were told he was killed in action before all this, but okay, good, good to go. Um, he, he's still alive, but yeah, he just, he came in and looked down at the leg and he's like, yeah, I, yeah, I figured, you know, you, you play around too much. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna, 
you're going to step on it one of these days. Or I think if you mess with fire, you're going to get burned or something like that. But he's just like, good to see you, son. And we shook hands. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, you could, like, even for a tough old cowboy, like, you can tell the the concern that was in his that was in his eyes because my dad was able to recover from a lot of his trauma from Vietnam from what he saw his son and other veterans um I'm sorry other wounded guys in the hospital the care that we received and so that healed a lot of wounds for him but when he first came in um I, I don't know because he's never said this, but I can only imagine he was back in 1960 something or 70 something. And he's just waiting for, you know, what he experienced back then. And so as, as this level of care is coming in and, and these doctors and, 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 and the nurses and the physical therapists and everything like that, and, and they're doing so much to, to, to take the shattered, um, shell of a man and, and women, woman also, but to take the shattered shell of a service member and, and, and to try and put this thing back together again, to give them some semblance of normalcy, even though their entire world has just changed. And, and the questions of everything that's going on, oh, and let's throw on every single drug in the world they're on um, to keep the pain down, uncertainty, scared, and everything like that. And they were taken in such a professional manner. And then the next wounded guy would come in and they would have to recock and do it all over again. And they did it so professionally that it actually, my, my dad started seeing like, Hey, you know, I can put a lot of these demons from Vietnam to rest. And I think, um, you know, when he came in and that first encounter we had, he was very protective, even though he didn't like an outsider looking in, you wouldn't been able to see it, but I knew like he was, he was like, all right, here we go. Let's see what you got kind of thing. My question to that would be, and it's kind of a two part. First off, when all this happens to you, you see him, you see everything that he came through, all the trauma that he brought from Vietnam and everything. Do you ever mm -hmm. worry in your brain? Oh shit. This might happen to me now. I'm starting to, almost have a self-fulfilling prophecy? Um, I would say no, because my dad kept all that away from us. It wasn't until I got blown up to where he thought that I would be able to understand him. Um, even, even through my time in the Navy and the Air Force, he never really talked about anything. He would never divulge anything. And it okay. wasn't until, until I was at that point of you know, that he could actually relate to like, look, son. And that's where all this advice started flowing out of them was because now all of a sudden I can relate to this, you know? Um, but instead the treatment that I was getting and I, I, I hands 100% hands down. Um, I had world-class treatment. I know people have had it differently and they, they'll, the, you know, and I've, I've definitely seen people voice it differently, but I had world-class treatment. Um, my time at Bamsey and, and everything like that. But I think that, you know, that was able to heal a lot, you know, with my old man. And, um, and I, it, and I saw that, but no, throughout the years, I just, I, I never quite knew exactly. And coming home for him was, I mean, he came home twice. He did two tours in Vietnam. Back to and back, so, right? Mm -hmm. Just with yeah, the R and R in there, but back to back. Yep. Yep, R and R, and he told me about San Francisco coming home, and I was like, <laughs> I I would have killed somebody. He's like, well, you say that, but what are you gonna do? So, um, yeah, I I just no, I I didn't really know much until he knew that we were kind of on the same playing field. If if, if that makes no it, no that sense. that does, but that would lead into the next question. Do you mm -hmm. ever think he feared that? Yes. Um, I think that when he first got to the hospital, he, I, I, there's no way he couldn't have regurgitated, um, 68, 69. I, I just don't think it's possible. Um, maybe, 
maybe not. He never dis, um, disclosed to me whether he did or didn't. But you can't go through something like that, even if it was in the 60s, and not have not have that be forefront in your mind. Like, hey, or, you know, because, let, I mean, let's face it. Yeah, his son just got blown up. Okay, great, whatever. Um, but he was a he he was a bulldog in it not saying anything to anybody but he was in the corner of the room and he would sit there for 19 20 hours a day until he until they gained his trust it was very it, it was weird but <laughs> but that's what i think it was you know was the fact that um until he trusted he wasn't he wasn't letting his eyes off so that's my belief with as good as you had it with him, because you always spoke highly of him throughout your whole life, this had to have brought you closer. Yeah, no, it it one hundred percent did. It it brought us closer, but it also it taught me as much as I mean, as much as I could learn being on that many um, drugs, uh, methadone for <laughs> one. But it 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 definitely it, it opened my eyes to like the, the struggles he had. I mean, my dad went from being, you know, he's, he's this rancher doing his thing to now he's dumping piss buckets and, and he's trying to, he's trying to, um, help a, you know, help his kid out when he has a breakdown because his life is, has been forever changed. And, and he's got every cocktail known to man that's going through his veins just to keep him, you know, numbed up enough so we can continue this leg, um, reattachment and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, I just, I mean, there's it. There's no way it wasn't kind of an effect on him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he he seems like a a great man and everything. There was it was so, I would say with him it was so selfless and um, just I I never I never took from your book that he wanted something in return for it. It was his love for you mm-hmm. and just wanted to see you happy, see you get it through because a lot of people don't know unless they read the book that you went back and forth, like keep the leg, lose the leg, keep the leg, lose the leg. You, you were going through a ton of different things. Like you said, you weren't in the right mind state uh, because of the drugs that were going through you. And he really was the one that, that helped you out. Even when you went away where you weren't supposed to and walked on your own, he was the one that came and, kind of talked to you and told you stop doing that and you, you gotta you gotta do it like this so well let's i mean let's be fair when i wheeled out and i was like i'm gonna walk to the window he was <laughs> the one that said we're already in a hospital so you know what's the worst that can happen you're good to go <laughs> i mean let's you know okay <laughs> but like, okay i had snuck, I, I, I had snuck into the uh the hospital gym that was for employees only and I was Ryan Hendrickson in a weight room again. And, and, and so I'm throwing weights on the bench and I get up underneath it and boom, right onto my chest. I cannot move. I'm freaking, <laughs> and it's rolling towards my Adam's apple and the nurses come in and they're yelling at me and stuff. And my dad's in the background just laughing. So, I mean, he could have instigated some stuff too, but. Okay. All right. I, I'll, uh, <laughs> I, Help me out here. I'm trying to make him. Uh, I'm trying to make him out to be the hero of the story. Uh, okay, so you go through the Thor program, correct? Mm-hmm. Now I've had Nick so, Avery on here, and he talks. Um, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. At the CFI, it was just the Center for the Intrepid, and then when I got back to Seventh Group, it was the Thor program. Okay. When you go through the Thor program, I just want to talk about it for a second because uh, Nick Lavery was on here. He went through the Thor program, and he mm-hmm. s- says that that that's the the thing that really made him like focus and get going and things like that. Do you have the same feelings about that program? Oh yeah the uh, the Thor program changed my life. I mean, I got back to seventh group um, after after my injuries. I got back to seventh group. And um, started the Thor program because I, I knew like if I was ever going to deploy again, I needed to prove myself. And the Thor program, I mean, it held up to its name, Return to Fight. And it did. I mean, just again, world-class trainers. 
physical therapists, occupational therapists, athletic trainers, everything. I mean, they, they broke me off, but in the end, um, they had built me up to a guy that just had his leg reattached to a point to where I'm out doing guys that haven't even been injured before to where they could not deny my, my value, my, you know, I, I could be a value asset on an ODH team, which inevitably led up or led up to the 2012 deployment, roughly 17 months after I stepped on an IED, I'm back in Afghanistan again because of the Thor program. Let's talk about when you get back into it. Uh, you go back to the to special forces. You get back on a mission. You get back on a deployment. I want to read a quote from your teammate that you put in the book. They came up to you and they were talking to you and they said, you have something to prove, Ryan. Is that why you're back? You think coming out here will close any doors for you, make you feel better about yourself, help you come to any conclusions in life? I mean, I'm glad you're alive, but I don't agree with you being out here. No offense, but you should not be in the Panjwan. Uh, you being here could put our team in a bad situation. It's kind of a shitty thing yeah. to come back to when you're just trying to help the cause. Yeah, but in a way, I mean, as shitty as it sounded, I 100% um, understand it, and I 100% agree with their outlook um, and, and the why they were skeptical because most of those guys were there in 2010 when I got blown up and they know what happened to me. Um, I was even lucky to be alive. And now I made it back to Afghanistan and the Sergeant major, um, he, who told me like, I'll send you back to war. If you can get medically cleared, not only did he send me back to war, he sent me to the most IED area in Afghanistan in 2012. And that was Panjway district, Kandahar province. And so when the ODA, you know, when I joined the team again, they're like, dude, this isn't a make a wish foundation for, for green berets. Like people are dying out here. And we were, we were doing, we were doing ramp ceremonies all the time um, for the uplift guys. Or, I mean, for the infantry guys that were at the base we were at. And it was, it, it was an, it was, it was an extremely IED area, especially after the Bellumbi massacre that happened in 2012. Um, the IEDs just flooded in and that's when I was there. And, um, so yeah, even though it was a very lonely feeling like, great, I worked my ass off to get back and I felt like I did this great thing. I was selfishly looking at it. Like, what, what do you mean? You guys are this, what are you talking about? I'm back. You guys should all be happy. This is a big celebration, but I had to take off those blinders to understand that they're looking out for the team as a whole. Can this guy do his job? Can this guy pull me out of a, um, you know, if I've been shot a couple of times, can this guy pull me out of a grape row? Can this guy carry me here? Can this guy carry his load? Can this guy even carry kit with his leg the way we last saw it again? Is this, is this a joke? What is he doing out here? And so, yeah, um, I had to, I had to prove myself um, and it, it sucked and it was, it, it, it was painful, but looking back now, I completely understand the mindset and I don't think any spot special operations team wouldn't have that mindset if they were in an area that it's like each teammates lives revolve around what that other guy is going to do. I completely, completely understand it. And so, yeah, it, it sucked. It really did. But, um, it, it, it made me grow up, um, even a little bit more. So it, again, which goes back to, you know, the whole IED and changing my life and, 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 and growing from it. Um, I had to look at this, this very harsh criticism that I'm getting from guys that I really thought would be so happy that I'm back. And now nobody is, I'm a liability to the team, but they're forced to have me on there because the Sergeant Major sent me there. And now it's like, well, well shit, man. And so it, I, I don't know. I, I understand it. I really do. I, I, I agree with you. Is there anger there though? When you first hear it, I, I know you couldn't have been thinking this clear as clear as you're thinking now. Is there oh, yeah. anger there? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was pissed. I was sitting there wondering like, what in the hell did I do? Like, like 
like this is this is it what, what what is going on here why do you got why are you guys so against me oh yeah i so, was not so were you ever at a point like fuck you guys i i can pull my own well yeah every single mission every single mission we went on so do you think like, you overdid it yeah oh yeah 100 percent. i think <laughs> hilltop uh hilltop 2000 proved that <laughs> yeah I, I i broke myself off um but 2012 was a pretty pretty dangerous year. I mean, I would say I would say nine, ten, eleven, and twelve were probably the peak of casualties in Afghanistan, and um, and so yeah, if I was going to overdo it, I picked the right time to do it because 2012. I mean, guys, guys were getting stacked up quick. So I want to talk about one more thing on your deployments, and then we're going to move into kind of the last phase of this. I want to talk about. The chapter, no one gets left behind. Yeah. I think it's an interesting and important chapter because of everything that's going on right now. So many things that you talk about in that chapter ring true to today about that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is the first, even through your explosion, your rehab, your divorces, your childhood. I told you, you seem very even keel. I i feel like in the book, this was the first time you let emotion come out. Yeah. Yeah. Boggling, Am I right? Boggling, yeah. Boggling 2016 was, um, that's, <laughs> it, yeah, it's the rough. I mean, even, even from stepping on an IED, Boglin was, um, that, that was the roughest I've ever had it. Yeah. It was there that 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 mission alone was um I mean it there <laughs> it took it, it made me who I am today, um, number one, because there's there's a lot of things, you know, up to that point had I been shot at, yes, I've been shot at. Have um have I shot at people? Yes, one hundred percent. Um you know, but nothing was so up close and personal until um, Puli Kumri and um, that mission that we had into into Taliban held area. And we the Taliban came out in full force because we did a little we did a little smoke and mirrors thing on them in the beginning where we they didn't know Americans were in the area. And we took Afghan Humvees with Afghan flags and everything. We took the Afghan Humvees in because our mindset was, and it was, it was successful to a point. Our mindset was we're going to infill into this area under, under the ruse that were, were Afghan commandos. They're going to Taliban's going to give us everything they got and kick the crap out of us. Like they've done for the last year to the Afghans. And then we're going to unleash um, the full might of us, you know, firepower on these dudes. Great plan. Everything's great plan. And, and so we, um, you know, we, we infill, we infill and it's, you know, it's, we get the green light and we start our, we start our uh, tactical ground movement and then we dismount and start moving in by foot. And now, now we come up to our very first strategic point. And that is an orchard that separates the village that we're going to clear from, you know, the path we're on. And everything up to that point has been pretty low key. You know, we got, I'm up in the front with, um, I, I got um, three other Afghans up in the front with me and we're all, we got mine detectors and we're clearing the way, doing what you're supposed to do. And um, we get to the the first major obstacle and that's an orchard. And anybody who's been to Afghanistan and I'm, I'm assuming Iraq also, orchards are real bad news, very sketchy. Um, that's where, you know, they, they booby trap the crap out of them because they have caches in them and tunnels and all this other stuff. So first come up to the orchard. It's like, okay, um, my clearance element, we're going to go about 15, 20 meters in front of the main element. And we're going to start clearing the orchard and then main elements going to move up behind us. And we're going to get up to the first compound and then we're going to clear the compound compounds already been just absolutely ravaged by just months of bombing and whatnot like that. It's like, okay. So, so we start moving through the orchard and um, we get to this bend in the trail and all of a sudden um, I hear this loud pop. 
oh shit so everybody everybody hits the ground like good soldiers we know what to do okay but nothing happens after the pop and i'm and i'm i'm caught up in this in the, like this this cobweb feeling like stuff and the afghan in front of me jaweed he's caught up too and he's god what is on us and so we cut our way out of it and it's in his tripwire and it's like what and at the end of the tripwire was was so what they were doing with the tripwire is they've got a clothespin and then at the end of the clothespin they have the piece of so the clothespin has metal right here wires going off it and then a metal piece, or a plastic piece right here and when you separate that plastic piece all of a sudden you connect or you complete the circuit which detonates the blasting cap, which detonates what was in the wall was a, was a grip shot charge full of bolts, nuts, screws, and everything else. So it low ordered. It didn't go off. The blasting cap went off, but the charge didn't go off. And we're like, holy shit. Like, okay, whew, that was a close call. Um, let's not have any more of those. So we get up and get ourselves out of the tripwire and whatnot and continue moving forward in about like – like 45 seconds to a minute later, I see this movement, this object sprints from one side of the, the compound. He sprints in front of the wall that has been destroyed um, to this little concealed spot. And it's like, what in the hell? And so we move up a little bit and you know, we're, we got weapons um, trained on that, that area. And all of a sudden this, this flash of light <laughs> bursts out of this, uh, out of this, um, closed in area of the compound, which, which was, um, in, uh, in our, in improved, uh, fighting position. So, um, but this flash of light just shoots out of it, almost like you can grab it and all of a sudden rounds start coming in. And then the entire wall of the compound, it just, there's just light flashing everywhere. So you got your nods on and it's just the, it's just the laser light show. You're seeing, you're seeing tracer rounds flying everywhere. Um, you see the fire that's coming off the muzzle brake. So we hit the ground and we are in, we are cut off from the main element and we are taking overwhelming fire superiority by the enemy, which is a really bad thing. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to fire back the best that I can. And I'm engaging, I'm engaging muzzle flashes, um, cause you can't really see anybody. They're barricaded in. Um, but our, I'm sorry, I said improvise. I meant DFP defensive fighting positions. So you can't really see anything. Um, they're barricaded in. They're in DFPs and whatnot like that. So you're just engaging muzzle flashes. But this one guy kept jumping out, shooting an RPG and yelling. You know, he'd yell Allah Akbar. And I was like, holy crap, they really do say that. And then they would fire it and he'd jump back behind the wall. And it's like, oh, man. Well, I had had my IR laser on and um, he had jumped out one time and he just – jumped right into where my laser was at. So I just started putting off rounds and we ended up dropping him. But then on the ICOM, I can hear on the radio, they were like, Ryan, Ryan, take your strobe off, take your strobe off. And I had my IR flasher on my helmet because I was the most forward position. And so for aircraft and whatnot like that, well, they had nods. So I, oh shit. So I, I pulled it off my helmet and I just threw it as close to the compound as I can get it to where the PKM was engaging us because they, they opened up with a PKM and then they did a linear ambush and just pretty much um, was just painting the uh, orchard with, with 7.62 rounds. But, the, but what benefited us was there was a little three foot ditch, two foot to three foot ditch on one side. And then I was in the middle of the road and in the middle of the road, there was about a foot of, of, of earth on either side of it. So the rounds were hitting that and splintering off. So I was getting burnt. It felt like bacon grease was hitting me, but um, they couldn't directly like target me. And so um, then our, our JTAC, our combat controller who, <laughs> I mean, the guy saved my life. Um, our combat controller was working an air to ground solution and they kept denying him. We can't, he's 17 meters from where you're telling us to drop this bomb. And finally, I don't know what happened because I wasn't a part of it, but it was like five minutes and five minutes and that fire, um, that, um, violence of action is, it's a really long time. Um, but it was about five minutes when they finally got approved is like, Hey man, if you don't drop, he's dead. 
And so they had got another platform on station that had a, a, a 500 pound bomb that wasn't a fragmentation producing. It was more of a concussion or whatnot. I, I don't know how it all works. Um, but our JTAC went through all the solutions. And I remember he, he got on and he's like, Ryan, this is going to be big, man. Um, you know, and he's screaming at me over my mic and he's like, get your head down, dude. Um, we got aircraft coming in and I'll, I'll never forget it. He's like, Hey Ryan, good luck, bro. He's like, good luck. Holy cow, man. And he said, he said weapons release. And so I just put my face in the dirt and I plugged my ears as, as like tight as I can get it. And I could hear the thing scream overhead, the, the F-15 scream overhead and then weapons release and then boom. And that flash of light that hit. And I remember I looked up out of the corner of my eye and I can see all the debris flying over me. And the first thing that hit, the first thing I worried about is this compound is going to come down on top of me. It's going to crush me to death when all the boulders from the compound come down. And I was like, oh God, please, man. And limbs are falling on me, um, branch, you know, just leaves and everything. Um, but it, it, it was the, it was the craziest thing. It was like, I can look up and I can see this huge shock wave blowing right over me. But for the most part, I mean, besides getting dusted real good and, you know, a couple limbs and whatnot like that, I was untouched until I went to get up. And that's when I realized that 17 meters is very close to a 500 pound bomb because, you know, the first bomb hits. Now it's time we need to pull back to the main element so they can actually bomb the area without worrying about killing the forward element. And I kept trying to stand up and I'd fall over and stand up and Afghan's trying to help me up here. And then he'd fall over and I'm trying to help them up. And we were just, it, we looked like just drunk dudes finally got back to the main element and they, they ended up uh, doing another um, uh, air to ground solution on it. But um, yeah, that, that, that first one, just the concussion of it, it was like, it was like you're in a, I, I think in you said in the world. book, it was like your skeleton jumped out of your body, slapped you in the face and jumped back in. Yeah, it was, it was out of, I mean, it was an out of body experience, I guess. I, yeah. I've never experienced even stepping on an IED was nothing close to that. Um, and it wasn't until we got into the compound and we cleared it and found, you know, found the bodies and whatnot like that. I sat down for a second once security got up and my beard, it was all like crusty. And so I was, what in the hell? And I stuck my finger in my ear and it was just this really weird, like liquid on my finger. And I was like, holy cow. I was like, what in the hell? And then I found out later on, you know, I ruptured my eardrums. I was like, mm -hmm. ah. Well, that makes complete sense for the uh, falling down everywhere. And that that started the mission. That was like the beginning of <laughs> what turned out to be a, a, a very long and, and unfortunately a deadly day um, that in Bogland. So. I want you to talk about Abe for a minute. So Abe, Abe was, um, he was one of my clearance guys up front and him and I, um, we had, we had become brothers over the years and, um, people won't understand it. It's like, ah, oh, well, he's Afghan and you're American. It doesn't matter. Like you, you, you sling lead with the same guy, like battle combat will unite you as brothers. There's, there's nothing you can do about it. It's impossible not to, if you both, regardless of what language you speak and what color of skin, um, you have, if you've both fought to, you save him and he saves you, you're going to be brothers. And so Abe and I, we had that bonding and same thing with um, Abe, Bezmula, Jaweed, um, and they're all Afghans. And so uh, people can't really understand it. And I don't expect them to. I, I used to expect people to try and understand it, but that's it. That's, that's a, I mean, management expectation is completely off there because unless they have been through it, they can't understand it because all that is, is that's an Afghan and you're an American. And so we, we, we start continue or we finish up with the first compound and now we got the rest of the village to clear. And it, this was, 
this was the worst village that I ever Clarence op I ever had. I mean, I, myself, um, I for, uh, maybe 17 IEDs. You ran out um, of C4, I, right? Yeah. I ran out of C4, uh, my Afghan NMRG guys, over 50 IEDs and booby traps. They ran out of C4 to the point to where we were have to mark them and go around it. Like, Hey guys, we can't detonate this, but there's an IED right there. Like we have to move around it. And so we got, we got to our LOA, our limit of advance. And, um, and so now it's like, all right, we've cleared this village. We've blown up a lot of stuff and, um, we've met zero resistance. Good to go. All right. And this entire village is completely tunneled, but all right. Hey, so now that we've taken this ground, Afghan commandos, uh, we're going to need you guys to hold it because we just took it. And, you know, up to this point, we've killed quite a few Af- or Taliban with airstrikes and whatnot. So, okay. And they're like, no, we're not, we're not staying. Well, what do you mean you're not staying? We just took this ground. The Taliban will come right back in. And they're like, well, you guys stay. We're not staying. We'd, what are we going to stay here for? What, 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 what are we doing here then? What do you mean? What are you going to stay here? Why are we here? Well, we wanted to drive the Taliban out. I know. And now we got to hold the ground that we just took. It goes back pretty far in warfare. No. So as this conversation's ensuing, um, one of the Afghan commandos comes up to me with um, our Terp, um, Jost, and he said, "Hey, man, um, there, my my guys up at um, my guys up front said that they they have reports of." Um, 15 to 20 men coming this way. It's like 15 to 20 men. It's like, okay, are they villagers? We don't know. Okay. Um, well, what do you think? And he's like, I think we need to go. I think we're in a bad situation and it's Taliban. We, we need to go. It's like, okay. So I tell the team, like, Hey man, we, <laughs> we need to wrap this up, dude. We got guys coming this way now. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Um, so the conversation slash argument continues with who's staying and whatnot. It's like, well, we're leaving. You guys do whatever you want. We're, we're fucking leaving, dude. It's like, well, well, you can't leave because who's going to, who's going to keep this ground. And it's like, you guys are the Afghans are we're leaving. So finally, and he comes up to me again and um, the commander said, Hey, uh, my guys don't see those men anymore. They disappeared. It's like, shit. What do you mean they disappeared? It's like, I don't know. But there's um, in this commando, he's an Afghan, so he knows the area. And he goes, um, I, I think there's tunnels. Like, Crap, man. So I tell the team, sorry, again, hey, man, we need to get out of here, dude. This is, if we're going to leave, we need to leave. And it wasn't second after I said that, the entire tree line, the, fr- the, 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 the compound in front of us, the compound to the left of us, the compound to the right of us, um, it just erupted in gunfire and the, the, we were, we were, we were forming up on, on this one dirt road to start our, um, to, to start movement back to our vehicles and this road, it just, it filled with dust, like thousands of horses were running down it, but it was all the rounds that were impacting in. And so we, we went for cover and there was two ditches on either side of the road, about six foot, um, deep a piece. And so we dive for the ditches and this, the, just this velocity of fire and RPGs are flying in and, and it's, you know, and uh, PKM fire and it's just, just crazy amount of firepower. And you look up the road and you start to see bodies. It's like, shit, man. Okay. And so now we're like, okay, Hey, look, um, we just, we got hit. We need to get air in. And, they were set and then the aircraft were like, we don't know who's who, which means they're in your lines. And so now we have Taliban within five to 10 meters of us and they can't drop because they don't know who is who. So we have to reconsolidate. We got to get everyone together, get back to a, a strong point. That's Americans and commandos. So now everyone past this point is bad guys. We're good guys lay waste to this whole area. Okay. Sounds great. But now the injured start coming in. And now you got two injured guys here, four injured guys there. 
And then, and so it's like, all right. And you're, you're bringing the commandos over like, come on, man, getting this disc, getting the disc. And you putting on tourniquets and you're, and you're bandaging up. And I remember there was a point to where one of the machine Taliban machine gun crews, they zeroed in on this group of three commandos in the, in, in the ditch and they wouldn't move. And so I jumped out and I sprinted over and I grabbed this dude by his hair and pulled him out and his buddies just ran and they got in our ditch. Cause we had more, um, we, we were, we had more cover where I was at and, so all this is going on and then eagle down eagle down eagle down shit so now we got americans hit eagle down is a bad bad thing over the radio especially when you can't see anything and so in my ditch there was only two americans me and frankie or excuse me frankie and i and we had about five wounded afghans with us and then a couple other, um, and we're trying to direct to them like, Hey, you know, um, put pressure here, you know, lean outside the ditch, pop, 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 pop. Okay. Hey, pressure here, tourniquet here, pop, 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 pop. And so we're fighting. And now all of a sudden I see, you know, I look back and it's like, Hey man, what are like, you know, the obvious question in all the chaos is like, what, what do we do now? We got to get to a CCP. Where's a CCP. And then we heard the sound that drops everybody's heart the the thump of an 82 millimeter mortar round going off or i mean being released and then give it 20 20 seconds 30 seconds whatever it was it explodes and so they explode and it was it was probably like 50 40 50 meters behind us and so okay and then the next one goes off and it goes off in front of us well you know how mortars work they're just walking them in far near split the difference and it's like dude we got to move now and so it's all right man so we're 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 trying to bring the afghans and and every time we'd pop our heads up rounds would come in so we were doing that boot camp duck walk which now i know why they do that stupid walk to see if you're if you if if you're fit for service is because we were duck walking down this ditch to keep our heads low all while we're trying to keep the afghans down um, and to get to the end of the road where I start to see Americans sprinting across the road to this one compound. And so I'm like, okay. And then finally I get radio comms with my buddy Joe. And he's like, yeah, CCP is right over here. Pop smoke, boom, CCP, got it. So we're moving towards it. And we're, okay, got our guys this CCP. We're going to be fine. And then the, C- the floor, the dirt floor of the CCP just starts erupting in in little dust crickets and now we look up and we're getting engaged from a two-story compound it's like holy cow man and so we're firing back at this compound but this time the taliban messed up they were they were about 60 meters away from us which meant that they were in range of a 250 pound bomb so the air force like yeah roger that and started and they dropped the bomb then another bomb so that that initially um that um, kind of, I guess, stopped that fire, but then more fire started coming in from another area and we were just in an unsecured um, compound. Not to mention if we tried to land any helos to start getting medevacs out, we couldn't because of the amount of fire that was coming in on us. So we got to pick up all the wounded and dead and we got to move to another compound. So at this point in time, we know we have four American wounded we have eight Afghan wounded and um, two Afghan KIA. It's like, okay, um, let's get everybody crop back across the street. There's a big field over here and it's kind of up on a ridge. So our, it, we have a backdrop of a ridge so they can't really flank behind us. They, ha- they can only go one way. So, all right. So we get over here and, you know, we're clearing like crazy and, and, and you know, they're starting to, starting to do a TCCC and all that other stuff. It's like, okay, hey guys, we need to get out of here. Men, weapons, and equipment. Let's go. All right. All Americans are accounted for. Afghans. We're missing dudes. Shit. We can't leave anybody behind. Nobody gets left behind. Okay, man, this is <laughs> this is bad. Um, okay, how many Afghans are we missing? And to that point, um, I think we'd already consolidated. Um, I think we had at that point four KIA. And so we were missing four. And two of them were my guys. And I was like, shit, man. Okay. So we went back towards the old CCP 
or taken fire in that area and is like, okay, we found one body. He was actually on the other side of the great putt wall. Okay, got him. Pull him back. There's one. Three. All right. We got another guy. Okay, he was in between these two compound walls. He's dead. Got him. Two. Where's the last two? Where is Abe? Where is Abe? So I asked Jaweed, where's Abe? And he goes, and, you know, he, you know, Abe, Abe, I don't know. Abe, Abe. Fuck, man, where is Abe at? The last place I saw Abe was 500 meters up that dirt road right there. And every time we poke our heads out, it erupts in fire. It's like, all right. So the JTAC, um, he's, you know, again, this guy, guy's a hero, um, absolute hero. But the JTAC's like, all right, hey, this is what's this is what we should do, man. I'm going to call in a bombing run up there. Um, if they're alive, I hope they're in a ditch. But we're going to drop some bombs up there, and then I'm going to have two Apaches come in. And what we can do, because we were talking the whole time, and I was like, and I, and I told the team, so I was like, hey, man, we have to go up there and get them. Like 100%, we will be looking – not to mention that there are brothers in arms, but if you just want to talk black and white, we will be looking over our shoulders for the rest of our time in Afghanistan if we leave those guys to, to, to the hands of the Taliban to desecrate their bodies and whatnot. We have to go get them. I, I so, want to um, stop you real quick, though, because I want to point out something that you point out in the book. You say that they're gonna, we're going to have to be watching over our shoulder. We have to go get these guys because the Afghans won't go get their own guys. I, I want to make that point very clear that you're telling them, hey, we got to go get your guys. And they're like, OK, go get them because we're not going to go get them. Yeah, that was that was a really harsh reality um, that I, I wasn't willing to accept. And um, in the end, when we formed up, when we formed up our team, so myself, um, the JTAC, uh, two other Americans, or I'm sorry, three other Americans, and then um, um, three Afghans jumped on. One of them was their commando sergeant major. He's like, I'm going to go by myself. You guys stay here. It's too dangerous. Well, no, it's not going to happen that way. But we're going to, and so um, we did have two Afghans that volunteered. They're like, we're going to go too. And one of them was their sergeant major. But the JTAC, so they dropped some bombs, whatnot like that. Okay, good to go. Um, now what's going to happen is I got two Apaches going to come in. They're going to do gun runs. And as they come in and do their strafing runs, we should take off and use them as cover. Uh, you know, uh, what, what is it? Um, uh, movement by, by, by contact or whatever like that. Or, or, um, so we're going to use these Apaches to fire and we're going to sprint behind them and then get up to where we need to where we last saw Abe and then we're missing one commando. It's like, well, we don't even know if we're up there. It doesn't matter. This is what's going to happen. We've been talking long enough. Talking's done with, we're going. And, um, and so, um, you know, an argument between myself and somebody else <laughs> kind of ensued like, well, if American dies because of this, blah, blah. It's like, doesn't matter. We're going, we're going to get them. And JTAC cut in. He goes, "Hey guys, we can discuss this later. Apaches are coming in." And it was it was like a it was like a football game. It was like ready, set, and then boom. and it was we just took off running. And I remember I was like, "God, please help my leg hold up." And we started sprinting up this road, and we got to this little footpath where the last place I saw Abe. And I remember I looked down to the right hand side as we're running up. I looked down to the right hand side and, and um, him and the commando we were missing were both um, dead in the ditch. Um, they've been they've been shot multiple times. And um, and so, yeah, so they were in the ditch. OK, we got our two. Now we got to get them out. And this is a six foot. There's about two feet of water at the bottom of the ditch. Six foot ditch, completely muddy. Oh, and both guys are covered in blood. So for people that haven't done a bloody body recovery, it's very slick and it's hard to hold on to these dudes. And um, so we finally, like we, we, we have support by fire got, you know, um, two of the guys that were with the team, they're, they're just putting down fire. And then the Apaches are just doing their little Hornet spin, just, just, just buzzing. <laughs> um, it was, it was so impressive. And we're, you know, we're grabbing Abe out and we got the other commando out and, and I remember 
um, we had this ladder that we brought with us um, just so in case we needed to look up over compound walls or whatnot, because um, at that point in time, we were in a part of the village that we hadn't cleared yet. So we don't want to start stepping around into doorways and whatnot. Well, we pulled Abe up and we put him on this ladder and the commando, thank God, he was he was about probably about 120 pounds. So it wasn't as bad. Um, so they firemen carried him, but Abe was 220. And so we have him on this ladder and I remember I, I grabbed him out and his blood splattered all over my face and it got in my mouth and everything. And it was just, man, I'll never forget that um, as long as I live. But uh, we got him on this ladder and, and we started hauling him back. And, and I was just, and I remember the commandos were just standing there in shock and they weren't, they weren't moving. And I remember I screamed at him. I was like, fucking help us, man. And, and they just, they just wouldn't move. And finally we got Abe to the, to the Blackhawk and, um, and yeah, we, we got him loaded up and, and he took his final flight um, that day, which, which was, which was tough. It, it was really hard. Um, Afghan or not, it was, it was pretty hard, but, um, but yeah, um, we, uh, we did what Americans do best. We had counted, we accounted for all men, um, weapons and majority of the equipment, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we had all our men and then we were able to actually move back to the vehicles. Yeah. You received a silver star for that day, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you had said that you weren't really concerned about, they had told you about it, but you were just like, okay, yeah, whatever. But the, the big thing that day was you lost a friend of yours. And like you said, whether he was American or Afghan, you lost a close friend of yours. So yeah. you come back from this, you come back to the United States and this time is different. And, and, and this is kind of culminating everything and wrapping everything up. And I don't want to give everything away of this part because I think this is about one of the most important parts of the book. You come back and it's a little different this time. You got anger issues. You got drinking issues. Um, w- to start off, what was different about this time coming back than any of the other times? So the, this time, this time coming back, I had 100% um, answered the questions of what would I do when I am faced, when I am, when, when in this situation, this, 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 overwhelming fire superiority by the enemy people are actually you know people are dying i mean we we lost eight commandos that day we had 12 commandos wia and four americans wia i mean we got we got our shit handed to us but i had i had i had this 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 complex about it this you don't understand complex or what was even worse was this entitlement of of you can't like, who the fuck are you talking to, man? Do you know what I just went through? And it didn't dawn on me. No, (laughs) they don't know what you just went through. How can they know what you just went through? They weren't there. And who are you to expect them to know what you went through? Are you that insecure with yourself? Well, I was. And so I started to take out like little anger issues on people from you know, a shopping, a shopping mart, you know, this, this guy that just said something wrong and it's, man, I'll rip your fucking head off to following a guy home, jumping out with my gun. Um, you know, just, just, just issues that I really had to address because I needed people to know what I've been through and it's impossible. They can't. And then, Oh, by the way, how are you going to cut me off on this road? Do you know who I am? What I just went through, what I've done for A, B, C, D, and E. And so all of a sudden it, it, you know, I had this, you know, I I was having a hard time dealing with everything that had happened because I expected people to understand when they didn't even know the story, (laughs) you know? Um, And that was, that, that was a, that was something that I had to come to grips with was number one, who died and made you God. Number two, you really think that's the worst combat that's ever happened in history. It's not. Let's take a look back on this little thing called D day. Number three is how can you expect someone to understand something that you want them to, when they weren't even there, 
And number four is like, why do you expect it? Grow up, dude. And so I had to do a lot of soul searching and, and growing up with, with dealing with that. Um, and, and a lot of that came from, from, from writing this, you know, from, from writing this book, because it didn't, it didn't start off as a book. It started off as me writing down, you know, our, our chaplain was, was like, Hey man, I mean, you always talk, we always talk and you talk to your friends and whatnot like that. And it's, and it's always about, you know, um, situations, whatnot. And you guys can sit there and drink a beer and be like, Oh yeah, man, totally get it. But the minute you go to your home and he goes to his home and you got your life and he's got his life, um, it's all dead air and you still have that burden. And he's like, have you ever tried just writing it out? It's like, no. And he goes, just put it on paper, put it on a word document. You don't have to let go of it. The one, the one pitfall that so many people fall into is this. I experienced something so bad and I want to forget about it like it never happened. That is impossible. And when they can't forget about it like nothing ever happened, they keep digging themselves a deeper and deeper and deeper hole because people will never understand and people will not react the way that you think they need to or you want them to because they just weren't there. And so you keep digging this hole because this problem won't disappear when in fact it'll never disappear. You have to, you have to use this problem or use this situation or this incident, and you have to use this to benefit yourself. And so um, I did, I started writing. And the more I wrote, um, it, the more it felt like, like this weight was being lifted off me because I wasn't getting rid of it. I didn't want to get rid of it. Like boggling is a piece of my life. Um, I, I didn't want to get rid of it at all, but I wanted to move it someplace else than constantly carrying around this burden so i started a journal and i just started writing and writing and writing and pages turned into chapters turned into days and months of just i would wake up and write something else like oh yeah i had a dream about this that's right and that's how my childhood came into it because now i'm burdening this stuff from my childhood and now i'm releasing it but i'm not really releasing it because i was trying to make stuff disappear my entire life when you can't make it disappear you have to deal with it and that's the reason why I think getting blown up put me on this path to actually dealing with things and not trying to just stuff them down so deep because if I don't think about it, it never happened. But that's not the point or that's not the case. It happened. And until you deal with it, it will continue happening. In my case, running marriages into the ground, being an asshole, being a person that destroys instead of builds people up. And so um, I did. I just um, writing from getting some of this combat um, incidents off my mind and off my chest turned into more things that were really weighing it, weighing me down. And all of a sudden I'm just opening up to all this stuff that I've just kept bottled up inside and not all bad. I've had some amazing adventures in my life, but I just threw it all on the paper. And um, then I went back and kind of organized it to what you see now. And I got a guy to look at it and make it and take it from a drunk three-year-old writing to actually, you know, him and I sat down sentence by sentence over a year of <laughs> painstaking edit, editing the book. And now it is what you guys have and, you know, what they have in front of you right now. But this, I don't look at it as a book. I look at it as a message um, because I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and, 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 and there's so much you can learn or someone can learn from if they just open up their eyes and their ears to what another human being has experienced. Um, that's, that's just my opinion on it. And that's why I chose to turn it from a journal to a book was because I kept having people tell me like, Hey man, like, like your experience is this, this is me, man. Like I didn't get blown up, but this happened. And all I got to do is take this part out and this is me or this is me or failure this or success. And, and that's the reason why I chose to go forward with it is because um, I believe that it, it is a message and not necessarily a book. Another interesting part of it to me is when you're talking about all this stuff, when we very first started talking and you said that when your dad's time was coming up in Vietnam and there was no point. I think the word that we really should use is 
You can't be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's all you've done. You've laid yourself out there in front of everyone and said, look, I fucked this up. I won this. I did that. I did that. I think at a certain point, some people need to also realize that when we talk about people don't understand whether it comes from a military background, law enforcement background, some people just don't care. And that's a very hard dish for us to eat that are in law enforcement, that are in first responders, that are in the military, that some people just uh -huh. don't care. It's hard for us to get over that. And I think that yeah. you've done that by saying that in this book. Look, whether you want to hear it or not, here's my story. If you want to listen to it and you want to be part of it, I'm glad to talk to you about it. If not, and I think that's where so many people get off track because they get stuck in that mind frame and that OODA loop of, well, they don't care. They don't care. Well, there are people that do care out there, though. There are people that want to hear their story and want to hear what they have to say and what they're hurting from. And they get so focused. I think that's where swinging all the way back to when we started this conversation, that's where a lot of people get off track. Yeah, I agree. And if you think about it um, now with people caring, there, there are so many people that need to hear um, these messages, look at the law enforcement community and what's going on in America today. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're targets for the, for media, they're targets for, for anything. And that's, you know, that's, they, they need to, they, people need to hear these experiences. They need to hear, you know, the law enforcement communities, um, their, their version of, Hey man, look, I'm a human being too. God damn it. I'm here trying to do A, B, C, D, and E. I have a family, I have a wife, I have a kids, I have this, this, and this, and this is what I'm faced against. And these are the pressures I'm having to deal with. And, and this is the public perception if I do this, this, or this. Well, the military, think about the military now. Look at what we going on, what's going on in Afghanistan. The military needs to hear this now too, because veterans, veterans and service members are in a dark place. They keep at you know that question was it worth it it was and some even go as far as to say it wasn't worth it and what did what was all this for and losing my buddy here or losing my leg here or losing this and this and and service members they're 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 battling too um and there's a lot and if you think it's just oef and oif you're wrong you don't if you don't think vietnam veterans are having some flashbacks right now i i would say that you're you need to buff up on history a little bit but from our law enforcement community to, you know, to our, our, to our veterans and our service members, people need to hear that they are not alone. Law enforcement, first responder and veteran suicides are through the roof right now. It is astronomical. The people that are taking their own lives because they are all alone. They do not feel that anybody else out there has an idea what they're going through and no one can relate and nobody cares. And that is absolutely 100% the wrong answer. And I believe more people need to start coming out and talking about this stuff and sharing their vulnerabilities and their weaknesses in the times when, you know what, I, 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 was, I, I was a few seconds away from pulling the trigger, you know, and this is why, oh, well, you're this badass Green Beret or, or SWAT this or, or SEAL this. And it's like, I'm still a human, man. And this is what I battled. And this is what I've been through. And this is what I've lost. And this is what I'm going to continue doing to support and defend my community and my country. Yeah, that's why people need to show their vulnerabilities because it lets people know they're not alone. And I think it's important. I think it's important too. And, and it's a, a great point that you bring up. So what's next for you, man? You've been a contractor. You've been a Green Beret. You've been all over the world. What's next for you, man? So I'm right now, I am going, I am trying to do the most difficult job known I, to man. I was hoping you would bring this up. And that is uh, my wife and I are, are trying to adopt right now. Um, it's a long process. I didn't realize how hard of a process it was um, just getting matched. Um, because we're trying to adopt a newborn. Um, um, but with the situation in Afghanistan, I would, you know, 100%, we would open up our doors. But we're trying to adopt and I, I want to become, I, I want to be a dad. And to be a successful father 
um, to, you know, to, to raise successful children, um, especially today. I honestly think that that is probably, you can, you can put all the special operations and, and, um, and, and special tactics, uh, police unit training together and being a successful father will trump all of that training put together 100%. And so I'm excited about this. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited about this new journey in life. Um, a little bit nervous cause I'm, I'm 42 and, uh, bringing in a newborn. Um, I've never changed a diaper in my life, but I'm going to figure it out. And I want to, uh, I definitely, I, 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 I can't wait to be a dad. It's, it's going to be great. So it is a great thing. I have three daughters myself. Uh, and, um, that first, uh, you're, you're going to think you're losing your mind with a newborn, <laughs> uh, that, that, yeah. that first, the, you know, that little bit that they're home, but it, there's nothing that measures it in the world. Like you said, um, you're actually mm-hmm. taking another human being and showing them, and, and it's how you talk about your dad. You're showing them this is the world. This is how you become a part of the world. There's nothing that trumps that. No medal, no no award, no nothing. That is yeah. a little you out in the world. And whether you did right or wrong or however you did it, that's your reflection yeah. for the rest of time. I'm excited. <laughs> I am. Well, I'm excited for you. I love that you posted. Then you you came back and said, I might have been a mis- little misleading on the first post. Here's what's <laughs> actually happening. But I'm yeah. very glad that you brought it up. Um, Ryan, it, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you and an honor to just talk about the sheer grit and and you know, humanity that you have shed on the light of so many things. And this book, if you guys have not read it, is absolutely fantastic i cannot recommend it enough you can pick it up in uh you know paperback you can pick it up on kindle you can get it on amazon there's so many places that you can get it you can also find you ryan at ryanmhendrickson.com uh it'll tell you all about him i think you can order the book on there too correct um Yes, there. Yeah, there's sites that'll link you straight to amazon right. or audible and stuff like that yeah so I would recommend that you get both the regular book and the audio book. Cause like I said, the guy that voices it is, <laughs> is awesome. So he did an, a fantastic job. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for sharing your story. If you want more Ryan, go to Ryan M check out tip of the spear. Uh, if you want more of me, you can find me on Twitter at double speak DJ. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast and you can find me on YouTube at the DTD podcast. Also, on all the sites that your podcasts are on, there's an audio version that comes out before the video. Remember, you guys come here every week because the best stories are true, and we bring them to you. That's Ryan. I'm DJ. This has been the show. We'll catch you on the next one. See you guys.